Okay, I think we're good to go. Yep, we'll get this. We'll get this meeting started. Welcome everybody. Welcome in chambers. Welcome on Zoom. This is the Portland City Council. We're meeting in a special meeting. We don't um, normally. We didn't have this meeting planned until last week, but um, so it's a one item. Uh, agenda. And um, so we'll ma make our way through this one important item. Um, and then we head into a workshop. So um, welcome. We It's an abbreviated agenda, but we will make our way through it. Uh, will you please um, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, thank you very much. And will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Fournier? Here. Councilor Rodriguez is absent. Councilor Dion? Here. Councilor Ali? Yay. Zaro? Present. Councilor Trabarro? Here. Councilor Pelletier? Here. Councilor Phillips? Here. Mayor Snyder? Here. And I do know that Councilor Rodriguez will be joining us just a few minutes late. Um, so, because this is a it's a it's a meeting of the city council, we will take public comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda, rather than do that at five o'clock, which is what's stated by our rules, which is the normal start time for a council meeting. We will I will look to for a motion to suspend our council rules in order to take public comment now at the beginning of this four o'clock meeting, uh, and then we will head into the agenda itself. So moved. Councillor Dion with a motion. Councillor Ali, can I get the second from you? Thank you so much. And we'll go ahead and vote on that. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yay. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevorrow? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. And we've been joined by Councillor Rodriguez. Good to see you. Um, so we have waived our rules in order to take public comment at 4, uh, at 4 p.m. at the beginning of this meeting. Um, and so at this moment in time, I ask if you're in chambers and you'd like to speak to the council, go ahead and step forward to the podium. We'd be happy to hear from you. If you're on Zoom, raise your hand and we'll make sure we get to you that way. But I think we've got a speaker here in chambers who'd like to come forward. George Rowe, uh, West Bayside. Uh, you know, you can always change your rules at any time to fix that little five o'clock rule. Save you a couple of minutes, uh, a few times a year. Um, so three quick things uh, to fill the public comment vacuum. Um, I had requested a copy of the fire department agreement with Port Properties for the use of the old Oxford Street shelter for some kind of fire department training. And um, that was a few weeks ago, haven't gotten it. I thought it would be a fairly straightforward request. I know if I was a property owner and I had a bunch of firemen running around an old building of mine, I would probably want that to be pretty clear that it's not my responsibility if someone gets hurt. Um, but um, also concerned uh, that the city of Portland is uh, happy to sign an agreement to possibly even burn down the Oxford Street shelter rather than trying to find a way to put it back into use even temporarily because of the homeless situation that we're facing. And it's also the subject of today's special meeting. Um, I also um, wanted to ask about the listening session tomorrow, which I almost certainly won't be attending, but uh, I would like to know if it's going to be recorded. Um, I think in the past, there's been some listening sessions that have not been recorded. And unfortunately, uh, I think the value of a listening session that doesn't get memorialized in anywhere uh, is uh, kind of pointing towards pointless um, if you don't record it and have it as a record for other people to parse and understand, including yourselves, uh, if you wanted to learn some things and have that as a, as a record to go back to. So I urge you to find a way to record it. Um, it. The Ocean Gateway may not have that capacity, but that's something you should have probably looked into ahead of time. Um, lastly, it's been a little over a year since I had asked about streetlights and the seemingly large number of them uh, that are broken and out of service across the city. And to my knowledge, both the Sustainability Committee and the Finance Committee, uh, neither of them have taken that up to investigate uh, more deeply what's going on there. Um, there was talk, uh, there was a news story that came out in the Press Herald shortly after my comments about uh, some uh, defective materials and lights and lamps and all kinds of things, including some staffing shortages. Uh, I don't know if things have gotten better. Uh, nobody does. Um, maybe uh, the catch is catch. 30 second warning. 
catch as catch can replacement of certain lights has uh, taken care of some people, but I do notice a tremendous number of lights off across the city. And maybe that's a conservation measure and maybe we're saving some money by doing that. But the point of these lights is to make our city safer at night. And that doesn't seem to be the case in a lot of cases, a lot of corners. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there any other public comment this evening on Zoom or in chambers? I see none, so I will close public comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. And um, in answer to the question about tomorrow night's uh, uh, event at Ocean Gateway, it's a 5.30 p.m. information sharing session as well as a listening session. There will be recording. Um, so we urge folks to come in person um, and speak to the council and, and city staff. If you cannot come in person, but you want to be sure that your comment is registered, you can go ahead and email that in. We, it won't be set up like a regular Zoom meeting, um, but we will have it recorded and available for uh, post review um, and analysis. And so um, again, please attend in person if you can. If you can't send your comment ahead of time, we'll get those and we'll have the recording made available. Okay, so moving on. Like I said, we have one uh, one item on tonight's agenda and I look to the city manager to tee that up for us. We will also take public comment on this item before we come back to the council for action. And will the clerk please read order 247 into the record. Order 247, 22, 23, approving the service provider subcontract between DC Management LLC, DC Blueberry LLC, the Maine Immigrants' Rights Coalition, and the City of Portland regarding 166 Riverside Industrial Parkway, sponsored by Daniel West, City Manager. Thank you. Um, I just want to first uh, thank uh, Kevin Bunker and Developers Collaborative and um, Mafal Chetam and uh, Maine Immigrants' Rights Coalition. Um, without them, we wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, this is a um, agreement in front of you that has uh, a, a three-party arrangement, including the city of Portland, um, that we would be operating um, along with Maine Immigrants' Rights Coalition, a uh, shelter at 166 Riverside um, Street. And it is uh, Kevin who will be doing, uh, along with all of his subcontractors, uh, all of the work uh, to make sure that the site is prepared and ready to be used. Um, it will house uh, single asylum seekers uh, specifically. And um, I'm gonna kick it down to Michael who has more of the details about all of the agreement that's in the backup materials. Um, it talks about all the specifics uh, of the operation period as well as um, how this arrangement will specifically work. But I did want to specifically start by saying thank you to everybody who's here tonight and specifically to Kevin and Mafalo for their um, help and to Michael for all of his work on this as well. Thank you, Danielle. Um, uh, so I'll give you a brief um, uh, a brief overview of the agreement. The the agreement and the exhibits to it are included in the backup materials. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions um, after I get through it. Um, and feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, the the as Daniel said, it's a it's a, a well, it's actually a four party agreement between um, the the property owner uh, and the property manager, both of which are de developers collaborative entities, um, the main uh, immigrants uh, rights coalition and the city. Um, under the agreement, which has and you'll see in the in the materials, there's a um, uh, a grant agreement um, from Maine Housing, which is. Uh, which is attached as an exhibit to the agreement. Um, under that grant agreement, um, developers collaborative will be um, purchasing the property, renovating the property and fitting up the property. Um, and uh, included in there is, um, is the city's ability to, um, to, to review the, um, uh, the purchase of all the furniture and fixtures and, uh, um, that and uh, equipment that'll go into the into the property. Um, the uh, the agreement requires the city to act as the primary service provider, essentially operating um, the shelter for um, a period of uh, likely about eighteen months, um, the first eighteen months of the operation. During that time, um, Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition will be providing meals. Uh, and also be providing staff to shelter, uh, or I'm sorry, to shadow uh, city staff who will be 
um, uh, sort of uh, learning the ropes from uh, city staff as the process goes forward um, with the goal of, um, of Merck taking over um, the operations after that first 18 month period. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, most of the, the rest of the agreement is sort of uh, standard uh, city, uh, you know, contract boilerplate information. I'm happy to answer questions about that, but, um, but that about sums up uh, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the basics of the transaction and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Michael. I just wanted to add one last thing at the end and um, obviously the, the funding uh, to make sure that this all works um, is provided through Maine Housing um, and, and specifically through the funds that the legislature and the, and the governor have set aside um, for these types of emergency shelter situations. So um, that's how the, the building will be developed and with using those funds um, specifically and also to address the um, the period of time in which the city would now, um, we will have uh, the cost of our staffing that we're currently using at the expo. It'll basically be funded and addressed uh, using those funds. Um, it will be uh, basically provided for and paid for in that way. So there's no amendment to the budget that has to happen at this time. Um, and so it is uh, not, it didn't trigger a fiscal note either because we receive reimbursement to cover those costs as well as have um, some additional funding sources, including um, donations, which we've been so thankful to receive that will be helping to meet th those needs. Um, moving forward, I just want to put the caveat out there for the council and for the public that if that uh, situation should change, if the general assistance funding system should be adjusted in any way at the state level, um, we would be coming back uh, to you all uh, to talk about that because this agreement does lock us in. And um, so that would be the risk that we would be uh, asking you all to take. Um, but we would be monitoring that and come back to you with an appropriation order or the necessary ways in which we would be moving or proposing to fund that in the future if that should arise or that need should arise in the future. Thank you, uh, thank you City Manager. Thank you, Corporation Council. At this point in time, we will take public comment before I look to the Council for a motion in order to have our own discussion. So is there any public comment either on Zoom or in Council Chambers? Yes, feel free to line up at the podium, make your um, make your presence known so that we we don't close public comment inadvertently, but we've got somebody here in chambers and I do have a couple of hands up also on uh, Zoom. So we'll start in chambers and I'll toggle back and forth as we go. So welcome, please give us your name um, and either your address, the neighborhood you live in or the organization that you represent. You'll be given three minutes on the clock. The city clerk keeps time and we'll give you a 30 second reminder. Thank you. Uh, my name is George Folster. I live in the Riverton neighborhood. Uh, and uh, here's what I prepared. Um, once again, it feels like Riverton is being left without a voice uh, with just a handful of days between this being announced and the vote taking place today. It hasn't left very much room for public comment. <clears throat> uh, many of my neighbors are still unsure about the proposed location. Um, I'm hearing many different locations where people think that it is. Uh, having the vote after the informational meeting tomorrow, I think would make for a much more inclusive government process. Uh, from the start, Riverton has always asked for smaller scattered shelters, uh, in part to keep uh, from any one area of the city um, from shouldering the load alone. I still think that's the best path forward. Uh, if given the chance, I believe that many of you would go back in time and do things differently in Bayside, and I think you're given that opportunity today. Beth, thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And thanks for being here in person. We'll head over to Zoom. We've got uh, Kate Sykes has a hand up. Uh, thank you. My name is Kate Sykes. I'm uh, in the Deering Center neighborhood out here in District 5. Uh, homeless shelters are us. Um, I agree with the previous speaker that uh, there's many, many things wrong with this, uh, this process and with this agreement. Um, first of all, it is ludicrous that you're having an informational session tomorrow about this, yet you're taking a vote tonight. Someone on this council needs to make a motion to, per, to um, push this decision forward until after that informational session or all the work you do asking Portland residents about homelessness, homelessness is absolutely for nothing. Um, so 
the other piece of this that makes no sense to me, and, and as, as much as city manager um, Daniel West says that all the specifics are in the contract, there are no specifics in the contract. We don't know how many beds this homeless shelter will have. We don't know how much it will cost. We don't have any idea what this, this contract that we're supposedly um, uh, signing tonight, how much it's gonna cost the city. Um, you say that that we'll be getting some of that reimbursement back from general assistance, but we know that general assistance is not reimbursed at 100%. So there is a price tag for the people of Portland, yet we don't know what that is. Our counselors on this, uh, you know, that are going to be voting tonight don't know what that is. So I would I would need some questions answered there. Um, the other issue is that, you know, here we are again, pushing the issue of homelessness out to the borders of the city where no one can see it in order to make a downtown core that's ripe for development. Um, in addition, this money that's coming from the state is going directly into the pockets of a developer. This money is not going to help with the running of the shelter. It's for private development for Kevin Bunker to own this property and for the city to manage it. Um, this is a really inefficient way to uh, be, be trying to address the homelessness problem and trying to address affordable housing. Um, in addition, this grant money uh, is coming under the heading of being for long-term uh, solutions to homelessness. Yet I've heard people here tonight say that this is about emergency shelter. So which is it? I mean, it, we're just all over the map here and it's just not enough information to actually cast a vote. Um, the other issue with this is that because this end runs city financing, the developer does not have to comply to fair, fair wage standards and the Green New Deal and the other issues in the Green New Deal that we put in around LED certification, efficiency, and other things that would help our environment. So again, we're building cheap housing for, um, you know, that, that basically helps private developers. And really we're taking that money out of the pockets of the middle class and we're putting it in district five where middle-class people live. Um, so who is this helping exactly? Um, you know, I would rather see again, a smaller shelter- 30 second warning a smaller shelter model where every district has a small shelter that can be specifically targeted to populations that need certain kinds of services instead of warehousing of individuals. Thank you very much for listening to me tonight. Thank you for your comment. Any other comment in chambers, please step forward. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's been great four years since I've been on this chamber. Uh, Claude Raganje, I'm from uh, Westbrook, but I also work in the city of uh, Poland here. I'm here in support of the shelter, and I want to first of all to thank you, the councillors and the city of Poland for what you have been doing for the community as a whole, for new men as asylum seekers. Um, I can't really thank you enough for your always support, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, in terms of, uh, I want to just share what happened to, to us last week. We went to the courthouse for families that were being evicted at the hotel. It was a sad day for me and the people who were there to see hundreds of families, inc including children and mothers, at the courtroom, just waiting to hear from the judge about the eviction notices. I know this shelter will be for singles, but every little thing that we do will be helping to alleviate this burden of uh, unhoused people. So I please urge you to not look at these political issues as sometimes we all try to do, but look at this issue as a humanitarian issue. And please think about those children every time when you make a decision and figure out what is the next step for these families and for these children. I'm here, I know we can say all many things in terms of somebody making money. I don't think Kevin really is making money over this shelter. He has so many other properties that he can make money over. But this is an issue that we all need to come together to address and resolve. Please, if you can, vote in favor of this issue so we can try to solve the unhoused issue. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. 
And next we'll head back over to Zoom where we have a hand up by Skyway, um, by Micro. That's all that I can see. Kate, it's Ken Capron here, how are you? Oh, hey, Ken. I'm sorry, I just see Skyway by Micro. Um, welcome and thanks for your comment, go ahead. Yeah, Ken Capron, uh, fortunately from the Riverside community, uh, what a great place to live until today. Um, First of all, none, nobody in the Riverside community knew about this until Friday, and only then because um, uh, one of uh, one or two of us were astute enough to check the, the city website and and find out there was a. We we're actually uh, looking at the meeting for tomorrow, until we looked a little bit deeper and we found out that today you're making the decision about something we won't find out about until tomorrow. There are a lot of people in the Riverton community who are really pissed at you folks for, for, for letting this go forward. And I have to say that strongly because I've been fielding a lot of calls about what are we going to do? We don't want this shelter here right now, at least not with the, the amount of information we, we have right now. And I can honestly say, I don't think a whole bunch of us are going to re be real good friends with Kevin Bunker down the road because he seems to be making money off taxpayers left and right. He's getting special deals while the rest of us are having to have to live with the consequences. I don't know what, what came across you folks that suddenly in a last minute with no notice, give, give uh, the show away, but it's got to stop. Uh, this is not how we want our city run. I know we need a shelter. I, all I can say is what I've been saying for four years. I've got right now a cruise ship or two or three that are in affordable range that could house between a thousand and two thousand people, with probably a similar deal from the main housing authority and the main uh, and fame and what have you, but wouldn't end up costing the city forever and a day. The city is is committed for some reason to subsidizing this and not letting private entities take over any of the housing responsibilities. That's wrong. The city needs to get out from underneath this, this beast and find alternative solutions. And that means stop trying to do everything yourselves and stop being, being impractical about the solution. Lastly, I want to say to, to the seven counselors uh, around the dais. Um, 30 second warning. Elections are coming up and I hope some people will, will express their opinions uh, through, the, through the vote. But I don't know anyone who's really happy with counselors' uh, actions over the past year and a half, and this is just the the uh, pièce de résistance uh, of of, of goof-ups. Grow up here and stop doing this stuff to your your constituents. Thank you for Thank your you. comment, Ken. Bye bye. Thank you. Any other public comment, either in chamber, in the chamber, or on Zoom? Uh, okay, we've got some folks here in chambers. Great, and we'll continue to toggle back and forth. George Rowe, uh, West Bay Side. I had uh, been alerted about uh, this agenda item popping up. Um, there's been a lot of problems with the city's website, calendar, and agenda portal in terms of uh, sort of ghost meetings kind of hanging out with nothing attached to them. And so I had been watching this for the last week because I was like, oh, I didn't hear anything about a meeting on a special meeting on Monday. And if I probably hadn't checked it over the weekend, I probably would not have had uh, the time to submit the, the written public comment that I did. Um, you know, uh, it's not clear to me from the agreement, and maybe that's a question for all of you tonight to get down to the bottom of, that this is going to be only singles. Um, I don't know if the state or the agreement or anything else is actually preventing you from turning this into a family shelter, from turning it into any kind of shelter for anybody at any point uh, during the next 18 months or beyond. So um, that needs to be uh, clarified. I had noticed, because I've never been on the premises of this particular parcel, just an aerial view, it's obvious there's like a big drainage ditch of some kind or some kind of a free flowing uh, creek or, or diversion stream of some kind in the back. And that really limits what you can do with this property on the back side of the building. And the front side is pretty close to the road and there's not much uh, uh, frontage there to, to work with. So this is not going to be a very pleasant place for people to hang out and spread out. 
Um, maybe there's a plan uh, that you'll soon be seeing where that will be a little bit clearer. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, I don't know if you're interested in getting down into details tonight, and that's why I asked you to postpone this. Um, I have a lot of respect for the Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, but it is a, a fact, I believe, that they are not really in the shelter business, and their track record may be very limited in that regard. And even though they're very transparent on their website with their 990s and whatnot, there's a big time lag in terms of what their financials and their employment and their uh, staffing issues are right now. So uh, a lot of time, I guess, to get things, uh, get ducks in a row in the next 18 months. But I do think that this particular partnership is an untried, untested partnership. And I that definitely gives me pause. Um, and again, as I mentioned in my uh, general 30, comment, 30 second warning. we have the Oxford Street Shelter sitting empty it is transit perfect versus this uh, outlying area. And it is uh, a facility you know really, really well. And the fact that you're going out of your way on an uh, exigency basis to make this happen, but you, as, as far as I can tell, have done absolutely nothing publicly at all to try and ask the landlord to bring that facility back online on a temporary basis, just like here, um, is, a lack, is a failure of leadership. And I don't understand it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll head over to Zoom. We have a hand up from Mary Cook. Hello, all. Um, my name is Mary Cook. I work at the Opportunity Alliance. I'm the director of the Emergency Rental Assistance Program and the PATH Program, which works with unsheltered homelessness. I'm just speaking tonight in favor of this and hope that the city council votes in favor. I'm glad to hear that we're coming up with some creative and uh, ways to solve um, around the housing crisis that impacts um, asylum seeking folks and those that are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And I think that this is a great step to addressing the overall need for the state. And I hope that the city continues to um, find ways to find solutions around the housing crisis and shelter crisis. Um, but glad to see this is um, on the table and being voted on and commend all those that are involved. Thank you for your comment. And I'll see if there's anybody in chambers who would like to speak. Thank you. I'm Fala Chitam, and I'm the executive director of the Maine Middle Rights Coalition. Um, your concerns about how fast this is going are valid. As an organization that's very, very small and has grown in the last 18 months, you know, it makes me tear up because yes, we are small, but we don't have the privilege to walk away. And thank you. As the organization that is shepherding municipalities, this morning I got a phone call from, from Sanford. In less than four weeks, the community, we had a meeting similar, and the community was as angry they didn't want anybody in their community. It was a very painful meeting. And this morning, I'm told we found 17 houses. Within four weeks, the same community that was saying, get them out. They're the same community that rallied around and found the houses. It was, it's an emergency. So Merck standing here and be partnering with the city and partnering with Kevin, that's all we have. And so in this, this shelter, we're calling it the Center for Transition Asylum Needs. It's because what we've learned since 2020, 2019, we're putting, that, we're putting that into that center. Right now, we have people who are, who are in, in you know, tents around. 80% of what, or people who are at the, asylum, at, the, at the Riverside Shelter are asylum seekers. Majority of them don't qualify for the services there. We are misplacing the services and we're trying to correct that so that we can support people who are out in the encampments. Yes, it is fast. Yes, it is fast. But we ask you to vote from a place of humanizing this, this, this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And we will head over to Zoom. We've got a hand up from Belinda Ray. 
Hi, thanks. Wow, clock's already going. Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Council, and thank you everyone for being here. Thanks to Kevin Bunker, to Maine Immigrants Rights Coalition, to Prosperity Maine, to all the folks who are doing the work to create this shelter that we need. I hope, Council, that you feel good about this. I think you should feel very good about this. The price tag for Portland is zero unless something changes uh, because you're looking at transitioning people from the expo over to this site. And that will help you to be able to find, actually you won't be transitioning, I'm sorry. I misspoke there because the expo is a lot of families I think at this point in time. Um, but the price tag for Portland is zero. And I did want to emphasize that public-private partnerships are crucial to solving the housing crisis that we find ourselves in. So we really need to make sure that we are including private developers in conversations. They are often people that have the ability, the financial acumen to help make these deals a reality. And I know that Kevin Bunker has worked tirelessly with the city of Portland, with Merck to get this agreement together and to, to make it come to fruition. I know that Kate Sykes raised an issue around this not being a long-term solution, but this is in fact a three-year lease. And I did wanna emphasize that the information around this is in the packet. I know it's a lot of reading, but if you scroll through in the agreement, you can see that there are 180 beds and that the target population is in fact single asylum seekers. The placements are to be handled by the city of Portland. City of Portland is to work with Merck so that Merck can build that capacity to be the shelter operator over time. And it will be a transitional housing facility where people will be able to have a steady place to be. They'll have their food, they'll have their meals, they'll have connections to services. All of these things will be on site the way that we know it works very well, the way it's working very well at the expo, the way it's working very well at the homeless services center. And I do hope that people will listen to Claude and Bufalo who are on the ground, who were in eviction court with people who are looking at having no place to go at the end of this month and understand that we do need to make decisions quickly when it comes to providing people with the food and the morning. shelter that they need. I also just want to add, I do not think you need to wait for this listening session tomorrow night. That is about homelessness in general. In Portland, it's about the encampments. It's about trying to figure out what approach people want their city to take. It's not about whether or not these 180 people should have beds. And I do not believe this will impact the Riverton community. Um, I'm running out of time, but thank you so much. And I do hope you will approve this agreement tonight. Thank you for your comment. Is there any other public comment in chambers? And, uh, oh, go ahead. Never been, I've never done this before. I don't think so. Welcome. I'm in the Catholic area. I live on 152 Tucker Avenue. Um, I live, this is, you probably can't see it, but this is what I see off one thing. The mayor of the you know what? Needless to say, I'm opposed to it. I, I'm, I'm lying here because, you know, I did come here one time before and that, that was a permit to make my residence a multifamily because I have both my parents that reside with me. My father passed, my mother's 89, and she lives right behind this building. I have grandkids. I also have dogs because, you know what, I lived there for 25 years. I chose to live there because, you know what, I raised a family there, we raised two boys. I chose that. I worked hard, I retired, and that's where I reside and that's where I thought I could raise my family. That's what I chose. I did not choose to live next to 180 beds. I haven't been here before, I don't protest. I don't, I'm a gay woman, I could care less. I say love is love and you know what? We should figure out problems and we should figure out and make them long-term. I don't like to be generalized as being an angry person because I'm not angry. I'm disappointed in the city of Portland. I've worked my whole life, my whole life to be back here. Mind my own business at that dead end street. I've lived in Portland and I've seen what happens at Oxford Street. I live in Portland and I see what happens on Riverside. I see people laying across the sidewalks. 
I know what happened on Oxford Street and Maria's restaurant moved away from it because of some of the lewd behavior that, that happened over there. These people can get in my yard. They're singles. I don't know any of these people from a hole in a wall. I take exception to that. I have my mother there. And, and, and to me, it just seems like it's so unfair that I have built my life. I didn't just land here and look for somebody to help me. I have worked my whole life to be there and to establish myself and to enjoy my grandkids. And you know what? Have a few dogs out there. And you know what? Somebody's going to sit there and arbitrarily decide and say, you know what? This is a good idea. Let's put this back there. Well, you know what? There's no transportation back there. 30 second warning. There's no transportation back there. How are these people going to go there? I was fully aware that this was an industrial road. Not an encampment. Not a place where people would just suddenly appear 180 beds. I don't live in an apartment complex and I didn't choose that. Did any of you? I just want you guys to be fair and you know what, maybe stand in my shoes and you know what, that's what I look at every day. I don't care, I'm sorry these people are, are, are homeless and you know what, I have no anger, but you know what, I wanna enjoy my quality of life too that I fought and I have, live my entire life for. Thank you for your comment. Madam Mayor. Is there, oh, come Apologize on. for the interruption. I'm getting texts from constituents not clear how to sign on to Zoom. Can someone, can you address that just for them? They're listening. Thank you. I believe the instructions are right on the agenda center of the, um, the city's website. So just like you would log into any other council meeting, or workshop, you can do that right through the agenda center on the council's website. Yep. Okay, any other public comment in chambers? Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I'll clarify, you're taking comment on the proposal for the site? Because I just walked in. Right, we're taking comment on order 247, which is the agreement between Developers Collaborative, Maine Immigrants Rights Coalition and the city of Portland. To understand that this meeting was going to be at five o'clock. I don't know where I read that, but I that was my reading of the meeting. Um, we we do have a five o'clock meeting tonight, which has been on the calendar. It's a workshop. Yeah, it's five o'clock originally. So, um, my name is Stephen Sharp. I'm with um, I live at Bracket Street in Portland. Uh, I am going to tell you that this uh, without notes because I didn't have a chance, you know, to follow up on stuff. Uh, this is not the correct place to old house uh, anybody. It is an industrial park. Uh, it is these, um, this building is wedged between two high, uh, high use industrial buildings. Um, and it just makes no sense that anybody would decide to uh, site a um, homeless shelter here. It is probably worse th than picking Blueberry Road as a homeless shelter site. Um, and uh, that, that's that's really the gist of where I come from on this. And, but but just looking at the details of it, um, it makes no sense. It is over, it, and I'm sorry, it's just under half a mile from the nearest bus stop. The And I, I ended up going back and looking at the set of rules you were gonna put in place and turned out you ended up uh, uh, killing it. Uh, so I, I didn't realize that, but the, the rules originally had stated the bus stop must be at least a quarter mile from the location. Uh, and that is, to me, a bare minimum uh, for uh, inciting a homeless uh, service center of any type or shelter or uh, any emergency. You know, you must be near a bus stop. Uh, you know, um, I'm not sure you're you're within a quarter mile on the homeless service center, and you've got a shuttle bus. Uh, you built a new sidewalk. Uh, by the way, there is no sidewalk between uh, this service center facility and uh, um, Forest Avenue. Uh, so you theoretically we need to build that in the next couple of months, so there is access to uh, the the bus stop, uh, the number two, which I believe is a one hour loop on that uh, bus. Uh, but you, this this is absolutely not the correct place to be citing a uh, 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 any kind of uh, facility. Thirty and second warning. Uh, lastly, the idea that you would throw this on your agenda at the last minute 
uh, create a meeting, not publicize it that well. Um, like I said, I hadn't thought this meeting was at five uh, and you know why you popped it in at four um, yeah, it does not make any sense. But this is inappropriate for the way you're going to try and ramp this through uh, your, your process. Uh, besides the fact that you don't even have the correct zoning at the location. Uh, so I, I, I really think you need to kill this now. There is no reason to be building a shelter at this Thank location. You. Thank you for your comment. Any other in chambers? Okay. I see none, and I'm gonna close public comment on order 247 and come back to the council, please, for a motion. So moved. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Trevaro. Okay, now we have the opportunity to ask questions, have some discussion, have some debate among us with regard to um, to the item before us tonight. And I, you know, before before I launch into my my own thoughts and opinions, I do want to say that we have been working since last summer to try to expand space. So as we all know, over the winter, we opened a middle school gymnasium to try to meet needs. We then opened the expo, which currently holds 300 people. That's in addition to the 208 at the Homeless Services Center and the 146 at the family shelter. There has been a lot of talk and press coverage with regard to different properties in collaboration with Developers Collaborative. Um, so we've been trying to problem solve the issue of emergency shelter for quite some time, um, and it will not stop tonight. Uh, we need housing for families. We need housing for individuals. We need emergency shelter for both of those populations. So, um, the fact that we have an agreement before us tonight, um, is the culmination of a lot of consistent work and ongoing work. So. I look forward to the discussion with the council, but I do wanna say that in terms of providing solutions to very, very complex and dynamic situations, the problem solving doesn't stop. Um, it's never simple. It does require partnerships. Um, it clearly requires patience, and then it also can require urgency. So I think that's where we are tonight, is that we are consistently looking to respond as a municipality to the issues that we have right here in our midst. Um, and again, I, I look forward to the discussion. I have more to add, but I just wanted to say that for context sake, um, I, I, I personally don't see that we're rushing anything and this isn't gonna, this, tonight's not a one and done. We're gonna continue um, looking for solutions and working with partners. So I looked to my colleagues for any questions, comments, Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I guess I should start just by thanking everyone that's been involved to get this ready and at least prepared us for tonight's meeting so we can dive a little bit deeper. I, I, I do want to acknowledge the, what we heard from the public about this feeling rushed. I think that's a legitimate um, you know, feeling from our community. I think all of these, um, uh, you know, all these negotiations, all these dealings are probably going to feel that way because um, quite literally until they're in your backyard, it, you know, you usually don't hear about it. These are it's communications are just challenging that way. So I just want to leave it at that and acknowledge the, what we heard. I um, just want to start, there's, I have a lot of questions, but I want to ask about the transfer of services after the 18 months um, take place. Um, so I, what I understand from the agreement is it's DCM or DC management is going to be, uh, has to kind of clear that Merck is in the position to take over the services. So the training that the city staff will be doing to new staff of Merck. So I just want to understand, and I'm not entirely whether it's DCM or staff, um, what kind of, what is the expectation? Is there an aptitude that staff need to meet? Um, with, you know, because if, if that, uh, if DCM doesn't feel that that's, uh, you know, that that expectation has been met, you know, the city has to continue uh, providing services. So I just want to understand exactly what DCM needs to see um, for the transfer services to happen after 18 months. The, um, at, at, at that 18 month period or sooner, if, if it's determined that Merck is sort of ready to go, there will be a three, there'll be a discussion between DCM and the city and Merck to make that decision if they're 
if we're all comfortable that they are qualified to take on uh, the responsibility at that time. Um, I think that, that that issue will be sort of further fleshed out in the management plan that's going to be created during the planning process. Um, and so I don't, I don't know that I have a, um, there isn't a particular license that's required. It's going to be a matter of them having sufficient staff, um, who have been trained, um, and it, that training is going to happen over the course of, you know, the first 18 months by city staff. Um, and, uh, and so at, at this point we don't have a, you know, there isn't a checklist, but those will be the. Uh, the types of things that we'll look at, um, and uh, and there'll be an expectation that they are providing. I think it's in the it's in the agreement. They're going to be providing um, uh, two employees uh, every day who are going to be shadowing city staff for quite an extensive period of time um, and learning how to do the uh, how to how to operate the shelter. So, it, it, does that answer your question? Or? It it does answer, but it doesn't answer it because mm -hmm. then it, it sort of kind of leads me to understand that the eighteen months are not necessarily a, a you know that, that it doesn't mean very much because the meeting has to take place and the agreement has to. So us naming eighteen months seems to not have a lot of water under it. it doesn't it's it, it, there's a there's certainly a possibility that um, that we could get to that point of of handing over responsibility before eighteen months. And it's also very possible that it will take longer. And so there, 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 um, you know, I think everybody hopes that we don't get there, but there's, there's also the possibility that, that the city will be in there for the entire three-year period. Um, and I, I noticed uh, uh, Kevin was raising his hand at some point. If, uh, if Kevin, yes, if, Kevin you, if, if you, if you want to jump in with, with well, you definitely need to be involved in the answer or in Merck as well. Yeah, I, I felt like I was being asked a question, but I didn't want to jump up and please yeah. protocol. Kevin Bunker, Developers Collaborative. So the basic concept here is I'm I'm not I'm agnostic about which service provider it is. I just need the services to be appropriate, good, and safe. And that's not to say that I understand the service provision as well as either the city or Merck. But what I will be as the building owner is liable if something goes wrong, if there's a tragedy or something happens or there's a lawsuit. I'm I'm going to get sued or I'm going to be, I'm going to have liability. So I need to know that whoever is providing the services is providing them in an expert way. And as soon as I'm comfortable, the transfer can take place. So again, um, I just assume it be as soon as possible. It doesn't have to be 18 months. If it happens sooner than 18 months, I, I think any legal agreement, what it comes down to in the end is, can you trust, if you don't, have some level of trust in the person you're doing the agreement with or the entity, you shouldn't do it. Like if I, if I thought the city of Portland was a little bit slippery and I wasn't quite sure about Danielle and you know all that, I wouldn't be entertaining this at all. For example, just something that happened today, I don't know if it even reached Danielle's desk, but the, the city was late on its first rent payment at the Homeless Services Center. I don't wanna, I don't wanna blow that up in public, but I just did. But so they, there's a 5% late fee. So the management company has the math and sends out the late fee and, and cause we need to pay the bank. So we had to get the rent. And the, we didn't get the rent from the city because the city was still processing paperwork. And I think the late fee was pretty sizable. It's 5% of the rent, whatever that is. And they said, could you please just waive the late fee. It won't happen again. It was the first one. And we said, fine, waive the late fee. That's, you know, that's a small example. That's not necessarily directly to your question. But the point is, I'm, I want to work with the city. I want the thing to go smoothly and go well. And Maine's a small state. Portland's a small city. And I, I stand on my, the work I've done. I can appreciate that. I, I I should also say I'm framing my questions also from a, a place where I'm very very uh, it's important to me as well that the services that we're delivering are adequate, right? That that we're providing quality services to these folks. So that that's the the perspective that I'm bringing. So I I certainly appreciate your comment there. Um, you know, I still I, just to to restate it, I'm a little bit concerned about the 18 months and the explanation of it. I'd like to have a better understanding because in the contract it says that it's just DCMs, you know, uh, up to their discretion. Um, so I, I would just makes me feel better about what the discretion means. Um, I'm going to pause there because I know there's a lot of other questions that are probably um, and the different nature of the of this project. So I'll pause for now. Thank you, uh, Councillor, for your uh, question. Any other councillors with questions, discussion? I'm looking for hands, Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question, I don't know if it is staff or Kevin. Um, 
Today we receive, uh, I'm sure that some of my colleagues also did receive that, but I receive a lot of phone calls and uh, uh, we may have received some emails. Have there been any um, outreach to the abutters to this uh, property? Or if not, do we have any plans to do that? There hasn't been specific outreach, but I would defer to Kevin. There's going to be um, public process that happens around this in front of the planning board. I mean, that will be the future. There's approvals that are required um, and there'll be uh, a temporary approval that'll be put in place and then to allow for the emergency use and then a significant uh, you know, usual public process in front of the planning board. So that will happen um, as we move forward. And I think that... Um, I'm not sure if Kevin, if you've done any specific outreach to the to the neighborhood. No, not yet. I'll I'd like to answer that question, but I think since there was so much comment about the time and the rush and the accusations that you all were rushing it forward, I think it's important to explain a little bit about that. I was the one that asked for this vote to be held quickly, and that is a result of the pressure from the the grantor, which is the state, around the source of the funds. The source of this funds is winter warming shelter money, cloaking. Ilya has a different name, but basically it the grant requires that these shelters be open for this coming winter. So everything is backing into how much construction time it takes to get this thing ready for the winter, or we can't accept the money. So uh, what, what I do is try to match the opportunities with the funds that are available. And this, this, uh, this pot of money was available, this specific use. We first worked on uh, Blueberry Road. It didn't work out. Blueberry Road is essentially too big to make work. Um, we found a small location that does work, but all that time the clock was ticking. And when you back out of the time that is required for construction, we are right up against the deadline to get it all ready and be able to accept this money. So we could do a lot more public process and workshops and listening sessions and those kind of things, but we can't do it with this money. So this opportunity is here now, and this is an opportunity that has to, by the nature of it, really has to be voted up or down. And if it's voted down, it's voted down, and we let the option go tomorrow, and we don't do this. But for this funding requirement, this is the timeline that is required. It's not that um, people are trying to get something through without any kind of due process. And to speak to Danielle's specific comment, this does require a change of use. Uh, every emergency shelter in the city is a conditional use, even if it's already permitted as a shelter, but most new shelters aren't. And so they have to be, a, has to be a change of use process that happens. That is a public process. I'm not entirely sure yet whether that occurs the ZBA or the planning board, because at a certain threshold of square feet, it goes to the planning board. This on the first pass appears to be under that, but I'm not sure if some of the other um, things that we're doing would kick it to the planning board. So it's going to happen either at the ZBA or the planning board, but there, it will be a public process. The comment that this wasn't zoned for was incorrect. Um, that's another thing driving this. The, the city zoned immersion had a, a long public process a few years ago about where to site shelters in the city absent any specific proposals. And they basically decided on downtown business zones and industrial zones. And that was where shelters could be allowed in the city. So given that downtown business zones are the land and the buildings on them are absolutely prohibitively expensive, it really, that zoning decision means that the available parcels and of land and buildings that are available for emergency shelters are going to be in industrial zones. And those basically are where they are. So this idea about pushing folks out so that people can make money. Um, I still don't have any investments in Bayside. Um, that isn't what's going on here. It's a, it's a reflection of what the zoning is and the universe of possible sites that we have. And then just layering on top of that, emergency shelters that are congregate in nature, they lend themselves well to these wide open industrial buildings. It's really the options that we have. We don't have a lot of other options. And I know there are still people that are talking about smaller shelters, but the smaller shelters people were talking during the HSC process about all the solutions they had underway, all the things they were going to do. And I don't know if they've done anything yet. So um, I'd rather be someone who's doing something, trying to work on the problem than someone who's just sort of Professionally angry. Um, uh, thank you. Um, my last question is: uh, Can someone uh, walk me through on this? Not on um, Kevin, but on the city's side uh, between now to when uh, this comes to the uh, the planning uh, board? Uh, where do we place that um, um, outreach? And I'm asking that so that if constituents call me, I will know what to tell them. 
Uh, Councillor, could you repeat the one part of that? Where do we place? I, I, I lost you. On when are we going to start doing outreach to the? Uh, um, well, I'm not sure it would be us that would be doing it. It'd be the applicant, um, which would be Kevin. But um, specifically, that would happen during whatever process, whether it's in front of the zoning board or front in front of the planning board. I think the only thing the city's being asked to do here is to act as that um, operator who's going to help train Merck. Um, really, the applicant and the and the person getting all of the work done at the site is going to be Kevin and DC uh, Management and his company. So um, I think that it would happen during that process. Process. Obviously, there's specific time frames laid out in the land use code um, that, that he would have to comply with, and, and there would be notice that would come out from probably the planning uh, office itself um, or the zoning office, depending on which board it has to go to. Thank you. We would begin that process immediately. I'm not sure exactly when that would result in any required meetings, but we begin the approval process immediately. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Councillor. Next to you, Councillor Dion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As Council for District 5, I received a notable volume of feedback from my constituents and others. And I think this is the tale of two shelters. Many of those who called were under the impression that this initiative was directed at creating a derivative of the Homeless Service Center another homeless shelter to use uh, their comments. Uh, there's been very little understanding that the intent was to address the unhoused immigrants who arrived in the city. And even that concept for us has evolved from immigrant families to now unhoused single immigrant males, I would presume uh, some females possibly. They haven't understood that. What Riverton has understood is somehow this wasn't a fair deal. There was a lot of contention uh, in that neighborhood surrounding our decision to place the Homeless Services Center on Riverside Street. That's been resolved. A decision has been made. We have an operational center and um, the Riverton Neighborhood Association has a fully participating representative on the advisory board. And I think for the average Riveton resident, they thought that was the end of the story and that moving forward, their role was to do the best they could to accommodate that new reality in how they view their neighborhood. And now they've been subjected to media accounts to suggest, not with a lot of clarity, that some manner of homeless shelter is going up um, on the parkway. So I identify with that. And I, I've tried to reach out and talk to some voices in the neighborhood to try to explain that. And, and I wanna give this as a footnote. We've had a lot of conversations about this, many of them behind the curtain of executive session. We understand what's, what's going on, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it translates with clarity to the people who call Riveton home. It's, it's really that simple. And I think they also labor under the idea that this council has the responsibility and the authority to make decisions about this initiative wholly, that it belongs to us. But instead, the nature of this collaboration has shifted those questions to the planning board. That's not readily understood. Trust me when I tell you, that's a pretty alien process for many. And worse yet, if you believe, okay, uh, I'll take this to the planning board, they don't even get to answer the questions or ask the questions that they think are relevant to this initiative. They're going to be concerned about why is this happening? Who are we gonna serve? How are we gonna serve? And what's the adverse impact that I can expect from initiating this new service center in my neighborhood? They don't get to ask any of that at the planning board. They're going to be captured by discussions of land use code, building standards, site development. All right. So I think it's incumbent on us or someone to give them 
fair, honest clarity about what type of debate will they be asked to participate in if they take the issue forward to the planning board, right? I, I think that's incumbent on us. And it's also incumbent on us if we want to consider it is that we need to clarify that there are two significant categories of unhoused individuals in this community. We don't say it enough and we don't draw enough distinctions between it. There are those who are unhoused by virtue of their resident refugee status and there are those that are unhoused by individual circumstance and they need different kinds of services. In a reality that we could second morning. also with more clarity is that our one resource for the circumstantially unhoused has been overtaken by the unhoused who are here because of political decision to allow them into the country for any number of reasons. So we need to sort that out. And I'll close with this. I have a hard time telling them that it makes sense to vote on this the day before we have um, a hearing, uh, a listening session. I understand the pressures that Bunker and his team and the immigrant uh, agency that's here this evening have in order to meet in the deadlines. But I just need to put that out there. I understand what we need to do as a city and we'll act that way. But I think it's imperative and I'll close that the issue that's confronting Riverton and how they see themselves to have been a participant or possibly a participant in this decision is really up for discussion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Dion. Other questions, comments from the council? Councilor Trevorrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a comment. I agree. Everything that um, Councillor Dion has said is is true. I and it's clear. I think from some of the public comments tonight that there hasn't been a lot of opportunity for uh, people to fully understand this and um, and to sit with it and um, think about the ramifications. However. Um, this is an emergency solution to a humanitarian crisis that is in our city and is with us. And the people that we are looking to house through this project have traveled far and through dangerous con conditions and are deserving of housing. And my most immediate concern is to put a roof over the heads of people who are deserving of a new home. So I'm going to support this because I see it as, as crucial and as a moment of crisis, and we need to step up to the crisis moment. Um, so I appreciate all the work that has gone into this. It has, there are a lot of pieces that have to fall into place, I understand, for something like this um, to work, which is part of why it hasn't been readily accessible throughout the, the, throughout the um, process to the public. Um, but I, I think that it's the right thing to do and I appreciate that, that it is being done. So I'll be supporting this this evening. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dion? I, I thank you for giving me the latitude. I'm not going to respond to Councillor Trevorrow's comments, but I, in terms of the clarity issue, I spoke with Corporation Council just before the meeting and I talked with the team that's looking to develop this. As an example of clarity, the contract in the initial paragraphs refers to the initiative as a homeless shelter. So if you were a citizen reading that, I don't know if you go to all the rest of the pages uh, to discover it might not be. I think that the council should decide to approve the contract, should amend the language to say what is, is. Uh, I understand that the grant is very clear on the purpose for which they're funding this initiative. And as a lawyer, I understand that we use the term that's incorporated therein. It's like a magic uh, potion. We can just say it's all inside of here. You just got to go find it. I think a citizen deserves better than that. I think the contract should express the exact purpose for which this um, project is moving forward. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dion. 
And so I, I, I think I am to understand you will be bringing an amendment forward as we move through. No, I, I don't. I don't think an amendment is necessary, um, unless I'm told otherwise by Corporation Council. It's my understanding that, as I told him, I would tell the rest of the body that I think there should be amendment to the language, at least some clarity. And if it requires an amendment, so be it. If not, it can be just corrected um, and then subsequently adopted by the majority, then fine. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I'm clear. Corp Council, would you like to weigh in on that front? Yeah, I think that the um, uh, the order authorizes the city manager to sign the agreement and substantially the form that was presented. Um, the uh, the issues that that Councillor Dion um, uh, is addressing are are in the various documents, as he said, <laughs> they're incorporated by reference. The grant agreement does um, uh, specify that the. Uh, that priority is going to be given to asylum seekers um, and and first to um, to individuals residing at the homeless service center. So I don't think that I think we can work through those tweaks. It's not going to change the substance of the agreement. It's already it's already in there, um, but we can certainly add some language that will clarify that um, up on that first page. I don't I don't foresee any problems with that. So I don't think an amendment is necessary. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, I had a hand up from Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I uh, have a question about the um, the number of folks that are at the Homeless Services Center and the Expo that um, that, are, that are considered singles that would you know meet you know I would suppose criteria to take up a space one of the 180 beds. I'm trying to understand the um, effectiveness or you know how much are we moving forward. Um, by opening 180 single beds. Yeah, I, I again, the the city decides the placement, and the city has decided that single adults is their priority and the best use of the space. If the city changed that, that would be okay with me. I don't I don't presume to know the numbers as well as they do, but just want to point out a little piece here that clarifies maybe something Councillor Dion said and touches on your point as well. As part of that public process that we'll be going through. Councilor Dion's right, land use is really what gets talked about at the planning board, stormwater, zoning, those sorts of things. However, in the case of emergency shelters, there's this big, thick management plan that has to be approved as part of the, of the approval that then becomes part of the approval and then has to be followed. So what we have in the agreement now in appendix A or B or whatever it is, is a draft management plan as to how the city and Merck wanna run it until that management plan is done at which point that management plan will supersede it. But that would have all the detail in it about exactly how people get selected to be in it. And I would, I would defer to the, to the city manager or others to talk about the um, target population. And, and I guess as a follow-up, I appreciate that, Kevin. As a follow-up to my question, I'm trying to understand who are we seeing coming in? Well, I think we're seeing a you know a number of people. Obviously, we have about three hundred people, as the mayor mentioned, at the expo, which is mostly families. Um, right now, uh, which I believe Mafalo articulated as well, at the homeless services center, we have, and I'm not going to get the percentage exactly right, but it's about eighty five percent is single asylum seekers, um, and so they are you know the, that that center was developed uh, to provide specific services for a lot of um, our unhoused population that's actually in the tents and encampments you see around the city and they're unable to access those services due to the um, the single asylum seekers there which is why we focus this on single asylum seekers but I know that in talking with Kevin obviously the target is asylum seekers period um, and so if that were to change we would we would speak with him about that but right now that's our focus. I'm so, I'm so sorry, 85% of, I'm, I'm, that's, that's what I was looking for. That's the question I was looking to ask. I'm so sorry. 85% yeah. so of the folks at the Homeless Services Center are single, yeah. and that would still not meet the whole 180 beds. It, it would, it actually, it's been Just fluctuating. About, it's been about, um, I can't give you exact numbers, but it's been about 150 to 160 it's people. Significant um, so it's a significant, you know, and then up, it, sometimes it's gotten up higher even than that. Um, so I think that the majority of the beds would be taken potentially by single asylum seekers. Um, and so that would be the focus at this point. 
would that would we be ever able to change that like could down the road if we see that the need is more towards like families like and i'm not entirely sure if this is even the trends change this in this manner but if we start to see families not singles would we be able to reuse or repurpose the space i i think that right now the agreement um has a, a provision for prioritizing um individuals at the uh at the homeless service center um but there's also there's room in the language for change down the road if if that need um decreases so okay the the, the state had clarified that they were concerned about the initial move-ins new shelter that it be prioritized on the FSD. after that they say it's up to the city or whoever the subsequent service provider is just a, a little a little background to the this the idea for this started in in a room with Kristen and Aaron and myself and Cullen Ryan and Brian Townsend where we were talking about uh, the HSC was about to open and it was about to, they were talking about turning it over to the city finishing construction and and filling it up and it became clear during that meeting that it was likely going to end up the way it has ended up mostly um, filled with asylum seekers and that while a, a good thing in one sense it's it it. It hurts a little bit another to have thought so much about designing this building around kind of a different population and then having that population not be able to get into it. So I kind of said, what can we do? And Aaron said, boy, I wish we had that Blueberry Road building we looked at last year. And then that's what started the whole thing. So that's that's how we originally conceived of it with an idea that hopefully we could prevent some of the encampments from needing to be there. Um, that's I think that's the last question that I had. I um I guess I'll say, you know, yeah, I agree with Councillor Trevorrow's um framing that, you know, or rather her perspective of seeing this as a crisis and and uh, understanding that um our action will be faster than what we normally would want to set as a standard for engagement and and hearing feedback from the community. Um so I think I'm I'm aligned with that. Um, there's still some things that, as I mentioned before, that I don't feel entirely comfortable with because there's a lack of clarity, but I, I'm starting to sort of get the sense that um, <laughs> there isn't a lot of clarity in, in the, you know, these things, uh, despite how much we want to um, expect it. So I'm, I'm, I will be supporting it um, as, as we have it right now. Um, and I, I suppose that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rodriguez. Um, over to you, Councillor Phillips. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I certainly can't sit here and um, I'm not going to sit here um, and reiterate what everybody says. This this is an emergency situation. Um, we do have to look at it um, um, as human beings and, and all those things. I think Council Dinas, Dion said it um, beautifully and so did uh, Council Tavaro. Um, my question really has to relate to the building and what's happening with the building, how soon um, the building can get up to code if it has to be put up to code for emergency shelter. So can, can you take me through that process? That's my first question. And my second question comes back to the city, which is um, this has to go back to the planning board. So normally we get stuff from the planning board, then we approve it. So is there, does there need to be any kind of process once we approve it here, it goes to the planning board, does it then come back to us? So those really are my two questions on when is it ready? What's that process? Do you have to hire folks in order to build the bring the building up to code? Like, can you explain a little bit more of that to me, please? Yeah, I'll answer your, your second question first. And the second question was, will it come back to the council afterward? I'm, I don't I don't believe that it would. I think that there is a provision in the agreement, however, that says that if for some reason the building doesn't open, i.e., doesn't get its approvals, then the city can break the contract and then there's no more recourse. So I think there's an out if it doesn't come together. But I think once it's signed and official, I think then it's done. That's my interpretation on that. Michael can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the, I'll just jump in really quickly to answer your your second question, which is this: the the, the agreement that is um, that you're being asked to approve tonight is a service agreement um, where DHHS staff are going to be providing a service of operating the shelter, um, and so it's not there isn't anything that will come back. Um, um, Kevin and his team will be responsible for getting all permits and permits and approvals required um, through the planning process. Um, but it won't. It, there, there isn't any reason that I know of at this point for it to come back. So this particular thing won't come back. But through the planning process, doesn't don't we have to approve 
uh, buildings in general? Nope, like not zoning? for the. Um, not for this. Not there's nothing that I know of at this point that would require it to come back to this body. Yeah. So in terms of the construction and the getting up to code, there is a construction process that has to take place. Um, fair amount of work, adding a bunch of bathrooms and showers. A um, couple tweaks to the fire alarm. The fire alarm's in pretty good shape. The sprinkler is in very good shape. We need to switch out the sprinkler heads. Uh, adding a kitchen. There's no kitchen in there today. Um, probably end up putting a new roof and some insulation, those sorts of things. But that construction process is going to take us into November um, if we started immediately. So that's and where it's winter warming money we have to start. So it'll be construction throughout the, the summer and fall. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I will jump in, um, unless Councillor Zara, do you have something you want to add? Did I see your hand about to go? Go. Yep. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> um, thank you to all my colleagues. You've asked a lot of the questions that I think was on everyone's mind. Um, I have a few more. I'll start by saying that I actually was kind of surprised this weekend by the lack of correspondence in my email. Um, I was waiting to hear from people. And until this evening, hearing public comment, I think I understand a little bit more why folks didn't know. They, did, they didn't know enough. They didn't look. Um, so I, I, I want to acknowledge that because that's frustrating. Uh, it's frustrating for you. It's frustrating for us, right? Because we do uh, try our best um, to, to hear folks when, whether it's a large issue, a small issue, it doesn't matter. I, I know we try our best. Um, uh, my first question is, can and maybe this is for the Corporation Council, can you help us better understand why we can say this shelter is exclusively for asylum seekers, but our current homeless services shelter cannot have uh, you know, an exclusive use for type of um, occupant? Um, at, at this point, it, it isn't exclusive. There, there isn't an exclusive use. There is an initial um, preference, and that's part of the um, part of the grant agreement, um, and uh, furthering the goal of of getting the homeless service center um, to its intended use. Um, I, I I don't know, if, Danielle, if you have anything you want to add to that, but um, and I know we also have Aaron Gear. I think is yeah. on the Zoom and available to answer questions about you know the current situation at the at the homeless service center as well, but. Um, yeah, I, th I think that Michael uh, summed it up pretty well, Councillor. I think that, um, I mean, obviously, uh, th this isn't being owned uh, by the city. This is uh, by Developers Collaborative. So that's, that's one distinction, I think, with the difference, uh, it matters. Um, also, specifically, we're focused mostly on making sure the individuals get the services they need. So, for example, as we've been talking about, the Homeless Services Center was developed for a specific group of individuals. We're focusing on and trying to make sure that that group of individuals gets those services. And similarly, um, that would be what we would be doing here, focusing services, making sure that Merck gets everything it, the setup that they need um, to provide those services and making sure that the legal, the medical, the food, all of that specific for asylum seekers is met at this location. So um, I think it's not really about uh, specifying specific uh, populations of people, but more about the services that those populations need. And they're very distinct and very different. Thank you for to that a bit. So the, the, the way that the preference works, the preference is you, you can't specifically say none of you people can be here and only you people can be here. That's kind of against a lot of laws, but I'm doing an apartment project in Brunswick at Brunswick Landing, and it is designated for those who are homeless and asylum seekers. That is a preference, but the, the fact is the demand is so overwhelming that that preference is all that's ever going to make it in because there's so many people that need it. So we we have 60 apartments we're building. We're hoping to open the first 12 in August. We opened up the wait list a few weeks ago, and within an hour and a half, we had 250 names. And we closed the wait list. I think for a Vestas project, they got 1,000 names. So, and, and those are just preferences. So in, in theory, if there were no asylum seekers, the, um, someone who was homeless but not an asylum seeker could qualify for those units. But what we know is that just the numbers that are here, we don't see any way that that preference will not be what governs the, the, the lease up. Thank you. You both um, started touching on my follow-up question, which is, I guess, 
how can we ensure that the 150 give or take folks who are currently uh, in, in the homeless services shelter will um, make their way uh, or sorry, once that space is freed up, once those beds are freed up, how are we going to make sure that the folks who are now unhoused in encampments on the streets are going to get access and priority for the shelter? I think that's going to be a, a process that we'll be working with Mark on, ensuring that these individuals get the services they need and get moved over into the space once it's ready. And then from that point, it'll be, um, you know, using the existing staff that we have and the great outreach team that we have uh, to once those beds are freed up to be able to offer those uh, to the individuals that we have uh, on the streets and then to ensure that um, that they get access to them and really working hard with our community partners. As you all know, we have the crisis response team, uh, which has been put um, in motion. And so we have uh, about 18 different service providers who are assisting us with that team. And so I'm, I think calling on those resources and ensuring that we're all working together to make sure that the people um, specifically in encampments at that point get what they need will be would be the next step. Counselor, I think I saw a follow from Merck uh, perk up. Do you have it? I just wanted to tag it and ask you if you would like to respond as well. You know, we are running a 77 bed <coughs> shelter at Salvation Army. And we, you know, got the same funding, uh, which was um, initially given to us just for April, I think March and April. It's been extended to, um, to the 31st of July. And then now, with the losing blueberry land, we are all in holding pattern. And so in terms of our expertise, yes, we're not in the shelter business, but we've been standing in, you know, in emergency. And so we are running right now 350, you know, the budget of 350 for salvation, and that's 77 beds. We created that shelter from scratch, you know, without no city, without, you know, what we will benefit from this, you know, our partnership is also being able to help some of our organizations who've been providing culturally appropriate, you know, services. You know, the model that we're trying to, to do, even as we are shuttling, is creating a center that is a transitional place. When you look at asylum seekers, especially single adults, they are people who are able-bodied. But they just don't have the system to help them to the next, you know. So we're hoping that this place, again, the city, one of the closest I was telling our attorney to put in is a place of where the city is not even after 18 months, you're not off the hook. It's a partnership. And that's why to your point around how will you know? Because what we want to make sure is when people wake up right now at the riverside, they don't qualify for majority of the services there. They're in the street. That's misplaced of resources. When that happened, it was during COVID. It was, you know, there was no intention of saying, you put this asylum seeker, you take this mainstream person. But it just happened that way. Now that we know, we are trying to make that correction. And that's one of the things I, as an organization, I talked to uh, Danielle and Christian to say, how can Merck support to make sure that people who are in the, in the, in the, in the tents can come and access this, the, the services because we see that and we want to make that correction. But in terms of the center that we get to open, this is a place where we are creating, it's, you know, if you look at the model that we, we shared with the city, which will be part of the management plan, this is not going to be similar to like, just wake up in the morning and then that's it. This is helping you, you know, you're going to be applying for asylum seeker in the next 18 months. Here is what it will look like. You'll be, you'll be layered with organizations to help you, to train you, workforce development. So we're looking at a center that is, it is not a shelter. And it's a shelter in terms of roofing, but it's the systems. And that will be able to graduate. One of the things I've said to the city is, how can we create centers where people are able to graduate? You know, when I came, I was, Claude has left. You know, Claude's brother uh, found a job for my husband. We stayed in somebody's house. If there was no system there to graduate us, we would still be in somebody's house. But right now, because of the crisis and how people arrive, we, our services are not able to look at that to say, how do we graduate? And that's why we're looking at this model. Not so much that we don't have, we're not in the business, but we're gonna bring 
Merck has almost 97 organizations. And we're gonna bring those organizations to start graduating people into, so we are hoping that this is transition for real. So I'm hoping that you know the, the city is not off the hook after 18 months. We're gonna write that into, it's a partnership. And that's what we're doing even in Sanford is how can the system you know, be layered? You know, right now in Sanford, we're working with the CAP agency there. We're working with the, with the police there. Every part of that is layered so that they have the expertise and we're moving people around so that they are in their homes. We couldn't have helped to find 17 houses if we didn't create that system. So we're trying to help uh, again in this model is a transitional place. But if nothing, if, if anything that's more important for us is making sure that the services at Riverside can be accessed by the people who qualify and create a place of where these adults in this single, in this single shelter can also be moving around. It's transition, it's not. So we're hoping again, it's crisis, but we're hoping to create models that are not there now that we know. Thank you very much for the additional information. Councillor Zaro, you have the floor. Thank you. I really appreciated that and the way you just connected the dots for us. Um, I'll wrap it up. Um, we, I understand there, there is a political lens to this and there is also the humanitarian lens. Um, people have been asking us with great um, fervor, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, regularly for the past several months to do something about the housing crisis that we're dealing with here in Portland. And I know this isn't just a Portland issue. Um, we're often told we're not doing enough. We're not doing anything. Um, we're trying to do something here. And Councillor Diane was totally correct in saying that all of us were very familiar with this conversation, but the community maybe not as much. Um, and that's on us to do better, I think, next time to talk more about it with the community. And I want to own that. Um, but we do have a crisis right now. Um, and we do have something we need to do right now. And um, I feel like at this point, we have a path in front of us with partnerships from, from both Merck and Developers Collaborative to work with the community to, to try and feed two birds with one seed to help uh, move folks into uh, asylum seekers into a space that is is more conducive to their needs and to open up space in our homeless services shelters so that we can address the issue of the almost 200 people who are unhoused and on the streets. Um, it might not be the perfect solution, um, but it's us doing something with the community. And so I'm grateful um, for everyone who is working with us on doing that. Um, we need to move all three lanes though. We have to address emergency housing, transitional housing, and permanent housing. We can't just do one at a time. We're playing a game when we're only doing one at a time. So that's, that's for us to continue working on as a council and a community. And then the last thing I'll say, someone said it earlier, I can't remember who it was, but it reminded me of this phrase that neighboring is a verb. And when we have new people joining our community, um, it's on us to meet them where they're at and, um, and try our best to, to be good neighbors, even when it's not always easy. So I'm, I'm supportive of this. I will be supporting this this evening. Um, and uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fournier. Thank you so much. Um, I won't repeat a lot of what everybody said. Um, you've said it um, really, really well. Um, and Mafala, thank you so much for that context, because I think I've had the opportunity to work with the asylee population when I worked at Maine Health in the pediatric clinic and often saw children and families the day or the day after they arrived here in Portland to do wellness checks and started to just understand a little tiny piece of how disconnected our systems are to support this population. And now living it as a counselor, trying to help find resources. Um, of course, uh, to Councillor Zaro's point, you know, it feels like we're getting a lot of voices telling us, do something, do something, do something. And when we have an action before us to do something, now we're hearing also a lot of voices, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Um, and so I, I also acknowledge that the, 
you know, the information has not been out there. It's difficult when you're talking about contracts because you can't talk about contracts in public. We have to talk about them in executive session. And so until something becomes fully baked that we can share with the public, there's not a whole lot that we can share. So I can understand how this feels like a surprise. And if you are not working with this population on a regular basis, if this is not your identity, um, or this is maybe not on your radar as much as it is for the rest of us, because we're doing this work on a regular basis. So I, I do acknowledge that, but I do want to also lift up that as um, Mafalo shared, this is a transitional program. So it's not just a roof, it's so much more. And it's exactly what we need to be able to move people out of emergency shelter into permanent stability as members of our community, as they work towards being able to work and do whatever occupation that they had maybe been trained for wherever they're coming from and to be able to raise their families as part of our community. Um, so I'm so grateful at the lens at which we're going this, we're trying to correct exactly as Mofalo said, the, the chaos that ensued during COVID-19 where we're just trying to protect public health and protect everybody. Now we have the opportunity to untangle some of those threads and really start to get people the resources they need so that they um, can really uh, live sustainable lives here in our city. Um, I'm also grateful that it's a partnership. It's not just, people have asked us, don't let the city just carry this alone. And we're not, it's a partnership. And that feels really important to have not only a community organization that is working with our asylum seekers, but also a developer and business who's willing to say, all right, I have this spot. I'm willing to work with others to make sure that this is a viable solution. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that and that we also have the opportunity to teach others how to do this work. That's the only way you're going to expand capacity is by giving the information to others so that others can carry that work forward. And I believe that's what this is doing. Um, and this is absolutely an emergency response to a humanitarian crisis. And when you have an emergency response, you have to have creative actions. And this is a creative action um, that I believe of course, it's not ideal. We want everyone to be able to have their own homes and be able to build that, but you need to have an intermediate step to move the needle uh, a little bit forward. And so I'll close with, it's this is a process. So if we make this approval tonight, it's not all of a sudden in the neighborhood tomorrow. It has, still has to go through the planning board. It still has to have zoning approvals. There's still more community conversations to happen. And so I, I'm looking forward to having the community engage in those conversations. Um, but I, I will be supporting this this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Phillips. I just kind of want to piggyback on what Councillor Fornia said because I think she raised some good points as we all have here. Um, but the other thing is, is that this is a partnership across the city. And I think one of the things, I think we've talked about it tonight, but I think one of the things that we are forgetting, or I hope that we're not forgetting is, is that if we approve this plan, it's going to open up 180 beds at the homeless service center. And so we're doing this because we need to, we want to, was it rushed? Yes. Um, is it an emergency? Yes. Uh, we're doing all these things because that's what we do in the city sometimes because we have to. But what we have to remember is moving that population, and I can't remember who said it, but there were three, three I think it was Councillor Zaro. But there is a population of asylum seekers that are coming into our city that need different services that Merck can uh, provide. And then there are of those that are on house that are staying in encampments. And if we move those, and maybe this is also the city manager said, if we move those folks out into a shelter um, that Mufalo and Merck um, is more than capable of within 18 months of serving this population, we're going to be opening up between 150 and 180 beds um, for those folks staying in encampments. And the last count that I got, I think that we all got of folks that were staying in the encampments is about 183. So I, I just really think that that is in a very, very important uh, piece that we really need to remember in all of this. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pelletier. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've, oh my gosh, I've, I'm not gonna take very long because everybody has already said a lot that I'm thinking. Um, I did just want to say uh, 
that it's an honor and it's an honor and a privilege to have an organization like Maine Immigrants Rights Coalition in this community. Um, you do significant work and a lot of it goes entirely unnoticed. Um, and they're lifting up so many individuals in need of shelter. And so, you know, you are our partner and you are our neighbor and I very much appreciate your work. Uh, and I also just wanna add that the asylum seekers are our community as well. They are our neighbor as well. Um, and I really urge leading with a level of respect uh, in that, in these conversations, because I'm very aware of the thin line that we walk when we talk about this and when we border on demonizing people for circumstances that are out of their control. Um, I look forward to this city that I love growing and diversifying. I look forward to working to do whatever it is that we can do to make sure that we are advocating for our under-resourced community members. So you know, I, I, again, just think it's a privilege that we have this organization as part of our community, bringing so many people into our community in a safe way. Um, and that doesn't go unnoticed. So I very much appreciate you. And yeah, I mean, I, I agree with every, what everyone else has said. This was something that we needed to move quickly on. Um, it's not perfect or ideal. Um, but again, because we have Merck as a partner, I trust the process of it because I, I know you and I know your work. Um, I would have loved for us to have had a, a you know a listening session for this as well, and I think that time is just moving quickly. And I agree with my colleagues that I would love for us to find better ways to engage with the public beyond putting things on an agenda. Um, and that's something I think we can talk about because the community engagement around this is important. And I, I definitely want to recognize that. Uh, you know, a lot of this is significant and people are are feeling all types of way about it. So the community engagement piece, um, I look forward to doing better at, as a group as we continue forward with this and making sure that we're making ourselves available. It shouldn't all be on the, the District 5 counselor as well. Like I want to make sure that we are all doing what we can to, to be part of, of, of these conversations moving forward as the elected officials of, of Portland. So um, yeah, I'm I'm going to, to support it as well. And I, I really look forward to the next steps in ensuring that we can and will um, do whatever we can to advocate for our unhoused community, our asylum seeker community, and understanding that oh, this is really complex. And I think everybody is, is we're, we're all working really hard and this job is, not easy. And I think that there are a lot of moving parts. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the information and I look forward to, to seeing what our next steps are on this. So thanks. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, I will take this opportunity just to, to add my two cents. Um, I think that sometimes when we're sitting here in chambers and we've got an order before us, it feels abrupt. And yet, as I've been listening and thinking and preparing for tonight, I think about where we are in context. And I'm, I'm just gonna go back to the fall of 21, as those of you who know me know, I love breadcrumbs and I love to understand how it all goes. But in the fall of 2021, we started to say, asylum seekers are coming consistently. The numbers are increasing. It's not what happened in the summer of 2019. And so in the legislative committee, we started talking about that a lot and talking with our delegation and talking with folks at the state because we knew that there was an opportunity during that legislative session to advocate for services, funding, all of it with state partners. And so the funding that we actually are seeing in this contract tonight is a result of work that started in the fall of 2021 because it was approved during the last leg legislative session. It's FY23 state funding. So what we're contemplating tonight is year old funding from the state that has helped to a it, it, it it's a it's a response to the work we started doing in the fall and the winter of 2021 which was we really need help here um and i would say that that advocacy and that work has not stopped for one day in the city of portland um starting last in that session we were advocating then we as a council passed unanimously a resolution in June of 2022 asking for more help, more coordination. 
Then last summer, we started with the Blueberry Road option and having discussions and some press coverage with regard to that work and that collaboration to try to work with both state partners and community partners and developers to figure out what could be possible. Um, and then it's crazy to think that just a few months ago in March, the HSC opened and we moved out of rented space at Oxford Street into a new 208 bed facility. And at that same time, we opened middle school gym to house people because it was very, very, very cold. And then in April, the expo opened and was immediately filled with 300 families. And here we are um, in the spring of 2023. And on May 2nd, we took over the HHS committee meeting and talked about what's before us. We did it again the next week on May 9th. On May 31st, the um, encampment crisis response team that was formed by the city of Portland and is attended by 20 community organizations came together and that was less than two weeks ago. Last week at our meeting on June 6th, we announced uh, an information sharing session and listening session with the community to talk about the increase in the number of tents being used as emergency shelter for people. Um, and it wasn't until the next day that we learned that a proposed contract would be ready for council consideration on the heels of a whole lot of work. So I know that it can feel like, where did this come from? But I urge folks to reach out to us. I urge us all as representative of constituents to reach out and to make sure that we're communicating um, because this work, like I said, is ongoing, it's every single day. Um, so this item didn't get calendar, calendared until last week, but I would say that for me, it very much is within the context of the work that we all have been doing for years. Um, so I want to I want to also shout out some thanks. I want to thank the state of Maine and the funding that's being used in this partnership. I want to thank Developers Collaborative and Kevin. Thank you for for your comment earlier that. Um, it can be it can be hard when there are solutions on the table. Sometimes those solutions aren't perfect and we actually don't go with them. And that has happened um, in recent memory. But sometimes the solutions are good enough and we need to act on them. And so hearkening back to um, things that may have been, um, but aren't, it, I don't know if it's helpful to me. I see what's before us and I see a lot of hard work by you and your team. So I wanna say thank you for continuing to try to find solutions along with community partners like Merck and along with the state of Maine and along with the city of Portland um, who finds itself at the center of a whole lot of things. Um, so, so the last thanks is a shout out to our own city of Portland staff. Um, and as folks know, I attended that first meeting of the crisis response team. I was lucky to be able to sit in on that. And I don't know that I've ever been more impressed by city staff from all departments pulling folks together and saying, we're gonna we're gonna figure out a way to get this done. And by get this done, I mean get people out of tents and into emergency shelter or other housing options that are not outdoors in the elements. So I'm gonna be in support of this um, this evening. Um, I do also just wanna um, uh, respond to something that uh, Mafalo mentioned about um, appropriate services and and potentially misplacing services. And I think part of what we have before us tonight is getting the right services to the right people in the right place. So we've all been mindful of that for several months now. We really want to align the services with the population that needs that those services, whatever those services may be. And we do talk about the two distinct populations that we find ourselves serving in the city of Portland with regard to homelessness at the moment, asylum seekers and folks who find themselves circumstantially homeless. But within those two distinct populations, there's a whole lot of need. And that customization that you talked about, um, Mafalo, is, um, it's appreciated and it's important. And uh, it, it just adds to the complexity. And so these are not simple um, so not simple answers to simple problems. So I'll be in support of this tonight. Again, thank you all for the work you did to bring it to us. I see no other hands from my council member colleagues. And so I am going to um, uh, recall that we have a motion and a second before us, and we are ready to vote on approving the agreement before us in order 247. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? No. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? 
Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 247 passes eight to one with Councilor Dion in the minority. Thank you, everybody. And that is it for this meeting's agenda. So I'll ask for a motion to adjourn and then I'll tell you what's next. Second. Councilor Ellie with a motion, Councilor Fournier with a second, and we'll go ahead to vote to adjourn this meeting. Mr. Fournier? Yes. Mr. Carter, yes. Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Mr. Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. This meeting is adjourned, but we are not adjourned <laughs> fully. Um, the council will stick around. We've got a workshop um, that will, I'm going to give everybody a five or 10 minute break, go grab something to eat. Um, but we'll come back here in chambers to commence the workshop that was targeted for a five o'clock start. Once we um, move ourselves from our workshop into executive session, where we'll go into 209, uh, we won't come back into chambers. So we'll begin the workshop in here, public session, um, opportunity to hear from staff and others. Once we need to move ourselves into executive session, we will leave the chamber for good tonight. So hopefully that's clear. And we look forward to seeing you all in about 10 minutes. We'll reconvene at six o'clock. Okay, so thanks everybody for your patience as we make our way through agenda items this e evening. We are reconvened as a council um, in a workshop session. We're still on Zoom. We've got 12 folks with us on Zoom and um, some people with us here in chambers as well. Thanks for being here in both formats. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Corporation Council this evening to begin. Oh, I'm going to hand things over to the city manager this evening to begin um, the workshop. Um, at, at some point, uh, we will be voting ourselves into executive session. When that happens, we will not come back into chambers. So already stated, but just wanted to be clear on that front. So um, thank you for, for taking up the request to have a workshop tonight, and I will hand things over to you. Thank you. Um, this I just wanted to sort of ground us where all um, where we are. This was in follow up to some questions from a lot of counselors, but specifically Councillor Phillips and Councillor Ali. Um, and uh, in speaking with uh, staff, we've put together um, information, hopefully responsive to your specific questions. One piece uh, that you had asked a lot about was the First Amendment. Um, so I talked with Michael about it and he will um, present who we have this evening to present on that very important topic and answer your questions. And then the second uh, piece of this will be addressing specifically the uh, the the rally itself and the subsequent follow-up um, that the the police department has done. Um, but due to the fact that there is an active uh, criminal investigation that's occurring with regard to the the rally itself and specifically some participants in the rally and some maybe after action steps that will be taken, that has to occur, um, that discussion has to occur in executive session in, in order to ensure the um, that the uh, specifics of that uh, investigation are protected and remain confidential. So we will be doing part of this in public session, the First Amendment discussion and questions, and then the second piece, uh, we will be moving into executive session as the mayor said. And I'm gonna refer over to Michael to introduce our uh, special guest this evening. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Um, uh, as, as Danielle mentioned, uh, part of the discussion tonight is uh, a, a discussion about the First Amendment. Um, and we decided to bring in uh, a local expert in the matter, um, Zach Hyden, uh, who's going to um, uh, do a presentation for the council tonight and hopefully maybe answer a few questions. Um, we're not taking public comment, but questions from the, from the uh, counselors. Um, Zach is uh, chief counsel at the ACLU of Maine. Um, he joined the ACLU almost 20 years ago, Zach, um, as its first uh, staff attorney and has served um, as its uh, legal director and now as chief counsel. Um, Zach um, is, uh, uh, got his uh, JD from Boston College uh, Law School, where he founded the school's uh, chapter of the American Constitution Society. Um, he's litigated cases uh, to defend civil rights and civil liberties of a wide variety of individuals, including artists, immigrants, journalists, uh, pregnant women, prisoners, protesters, religious minorities, students, and whistleblowers. Uh, he frequently testifies before committees of the Maine legislature, and he has served as an adjunct professor um, at the University of Maine School of Law. 
where he taught constitutional law. So we think he's well qualified to share his thoughts tonight. And uh, Zach, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael and Danielle. And, and to all of you, thanks so much for the invitation to speak with you this evening. Uh, as Michael said, my name is Zach Hyden. I'm chief counsel at the ACLU of Maine. I'm also a resident here of Portland. I know some of you. I don't know all of you, but um, looking forward to speaking briefly and then happy to try to answer questions or have discussion with you if that would be helpful about some of the issues that I know you've been dealing with and that local governments deal with all the time. Um, some of you have probably, I'm guessing, engaged in First Amendment protected activities. You've uh, maybe marched in the streets, you've gone to parades or demonstrations, you've handed out leaflets, you've spoken to uh, voters, uh, you may have held signs up for some cause or some, uh, of some kind or, or at some public event, uh, you may have protested. Uh, but I don't think you've, you've invited me here to talk about the First Amendment activities that you all can engage in uh, free from government interference. I think more you're interested in as the government, what is your uh, what is the scope of your authority to regulate or to interfere with uh, First Amendment activities? And and this is a complicated topic. Uh, there are uh, some easy answers, but not that many. And there are some open questions in the law, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them. But in in thinking about this, uh, the presentation tonight that I was going to give, and talking with with Michael a little bit. The, what I came up with that I thought might be helpful, and we'll find out if, if it is, is to talk to you about areas of expression that are not protected by the First Amendment. What is the zone of expressive activity or speech where the government is allowed to regulate, is allowed to, uh, in some cases, punish? Uh, because there are such areas and rather than trying to delineate what does the First Amendment allow, we could think about what is the First Amendment uh, you know, not concerned with? What are some areas of expression that are that the first that are outside of the protections of the First Amendment? So I'm going to start with some non-relevant examples. Copyright infringement using copyrighted material without the permission of the copyright owner uh, to, for, for your own profit. That's a form of expression, right? That's expressive activity. It is not protected by the First Amendment. Um, you can be uh, fined for violating somebody's copyright. You can be sued for it. There's actually such a thing as criminal copyright infringement. You could, you could go to jail for violating somebody's copyright. Uh, fraud the form of expression, it's a speech act or written act, also not protected by the First Amendment, an intentional material misstatement uh, that induces somebody to engage in, in action that's going to benefit you. Uh, that's, that's expression, not protected by the First Amendment. Defamation, now we're getting a little bit more relevant. You as public officials uh, may have had people say unkind things about you. I, as a somewhat public official, have also had people say unkind things about me. We are not able to access uh, as readily the protections of defamation law because we're all public officials under defamation law. But defamation is a form of expression that's not protected by the First Amendment, particularly. There are First Amendment limits on defamation, uh, but defamation, slander, or libel, uh, making knowing incorrect or harmful statements about somebody. Uh, when you're talking about a public official, when you know that those statements are, are incorrect or you, you should know that they're, that they're materially uh, incorrect and they're gonna be damaging. One other area that I think is outside of the, really the topic today, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about it because it, I think provides a good grounding for the, the topic that we're dealing with. And that's obscenity. Why I think this is helpful is when people in general, people who are not lawyers, or even lawyers when they're not acting as lawyers, um, use terms 
sometimes that usage lines up very neatly with the way that lawyers and judges and justices use those terms, but usually it doesn't. Usually when people in public use terms, they use them in ways that are broader and more general than the way that lawyers and judges and justices use them. So if I say the word obscenity, what does that, what does that bring to mind? What does that mean? You know, I used to getting questions from this side, right? Right, you might think somebody, somebody is saying something incorrect, something in, inappropriate. Um, words that you don't let your children use or words that you wouldn't let your students use. Uh, those are, these are all things you might think of as obscene. Um, sometimes people think of them as um, sacrilegious. People often get think obscenity has something to do with, with sacrilege. Obscenity in the law means something very specific, and it's not, none of those things. Uh, it's a three-part test from a case called Miller uh, from the early 1970s. Obscenity means that a person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appears to the prurient interest, that it depicts or describes a particular sexual act, and that it lacks serious literary, artistic, or scientific value. The reason I bring that up is not to talk about it in the context of any events that have happened or any legislation that you might be contemplating or ordinances that you might be contemplating, but just to draw your attention back, sort of to ground us in this idea that words in the law have very specific meanings and that they're not uh, meanings that we can be flexible with. That's true in the law generally. It's especially true in constitutional law. So when you're talking about the the First Amendment and the scope of the First Amendment protections. We're all bound by these common definitions that are often handed down from judges or justices uh, and that provide a minimum level of protection to everybody, everybody in the country to whom the First Amendment uh, applies and protects. Okay, two other areas of non protected expression that I think are more relevant to what brought me here tonight. Th true threats and incitement. Um, these are different forms of expression that the Supreme Court has said are outside of the protections of the First Amendment. First, I'll talk about what a true threat is. And we get the, the current understanding of true threats from a case called Watts versus the United States. Um, it's a case from 1969. Uh, Watts concerned a prosecution of a person under 18 U.S.C. Section 871A, which is actually a law that was passed in the early 20th century that made it a crime to threaten the life of the president. The willful and knowing threats against the president uh, were a federal crime. So Mr. Watts was uh, an 18-year-old. He was speaking at a rally, and he was speaking about the draft. And he said at this rally, his protest against the Vietnam War, quote, if they ever make me carry a rifle, the first man I want to get in my sights is LBJ. And he was prosecuted for that as a bring, making a threat against the president. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned that conviction. They said that was at most a crude statement of political opposition to the president, but did not amount to a true threat. What developed out of Watts was the idea that there needed to be an objective um, component to a true threat. Something is a true threat if a reasonable person hearing or reading these words would honestly and sincerely believe that a person meant to cause the threat, that this was actually threatening conduct. I'm gonna skip ahead a number of years to a more recent case, a case from this year. It's actually currently being um, debated by the US Supreme Court. 
some of you probably know, the US Supreme Court typically ends its year um, by the end of June. It is now the middle of June. They have 23 decisions from this year that they have not yet handed down. Um, this is one of them. It's a case called Counterman versus Colorado, and it involves the true threat standard. Applying this, this decision from Watts and, and decisions since then, Counterman asks whether it's also necessary, you know, in addition to this objective component, for there to be a subjective component. That is, does the prosecution of somebody for making a true threat have to show that that person personally actually intended their speech to be threatening? And that's an open question. In Colorado, Mr. Counterman was convicted of making true threats, but the jury never found, the judge never asked, the prosecution never asked, uh, whether his speech was intended to be truly threatening. Mr. Counterman um, sent a number of messages, social media messages and text messages to a musician that he was somewhat obsessed with with over the course of two years. She felt that they were threatening and the jury said that the messages were objectively threatening, but there was never any evidence whether Mr. Counterman intended for the messages to be threatening. So we're gonna know likely in the next couple of weeks, whether that is a requirement for a true threat under the first amendment. A slightly related but different doctrine is the doctrine of incitement. So you could think of true threats as somebody using words directly to cause harm to somebody, to put somebody in fear. Incitement is using words to get somebody else to hurt somebody, to get somebody else to put somebody else in fear. Their speech itself isn't necessarily harmful, but they're urging somebody to be harmful. And incitement, like true threats, is outside of the protections of the First Amendment. Let me talk about two cases involving incitement. The first is the case that hands down the, the current test that we use, a case called Brandenburg versus Ohio from 1969. Brandenburg was a leader of the Ku Klux Klan. He was speaking at a KKK rally, uh, and he expressed the kind of harmful and disgusting racism that you would associate with a leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, part of his speech, he expressed an elaborate fantasy for what he would like to see happen to black people in Ohio. Um, and he encouraged the audience to engage in generalized violence. But when it got up to the US Supreme Court, they said that the, the speech that he was engaged in was not directed at anybody particular. And it wasn't directed at actually bringing about that violence, that the speech was not specific enough to be validly criminalized under the First Amendment. So making generalized harmful or hateful or racist speech was not enough to be validly punished under the First Amendment. The next case that I'm going to talk about is called Claiborne Hardware versus NAACP, and it's actually one of my favorite U.S. Supreme Court cases. The case is actually handed down in 1982, but it involves um, activities that began in the late 60s and went through the early 1970s. Uh, there was a, a town in Mississippi uh, where a number of businesses were extremely racist and the NAACP organized a boycott of those businesses. Um, one of those was Claiborne Hardware, which is where the name came from. At a rally, one of the NAACP organizers, a man named Charles Evers, who's a hero in the civil rights movement, um, engaged in very powerful rhetoric about maintaining the boycott. And he said to people uh, during his speech, if we catch any of you going into any of these racist stores, we're going to break your damn necks. So encouraging people to 
maintain this boycott, respect this boycott, and arguably calling on there be some sort of violence, right? I'm going to break your damn necks. Was not directed at anybody particular, uh, was not, the courts found, aimed at inciting imminent lawless action, imminent harm or imminent uh, violence. It was generalized. Uh, it was uh, more of an expression of a desire, not a, a call for an immediate action. And therefore, Mr. Evers's speech uh, could not be validly criminalized, couldn't be punished for that speech consistent with the First Amendment. That This was not incitement within the context of the First Amendment. I share just three final thoughts, and then I hope I can answer some questions or, or try to answer some questions. Sometimes people try to understand the First Amendment and the scope of the First Amendment's um, protections in relation to particular speakers. Does this group have First Amendment rights, or does this person have rights under the First Amendment? And I don't find that to be a generally helpful way of understanding or analyzing an activity for First Amendment purposes. That's not how courts generally go about thinking about the First Amendment and the scope of the First Amendment. Does uh, this person or this group have First Amendment rights? Sometimes uh, people try to understand the First Amendment in relation to particular actions. Is this activity protected by the First Amendment or is that form of expressive activity protected by the First Amendment? That's closer to how courts deal with it, but it's still not, it's not exactly how they deal with it. It's not precisely how courts um, analyze activities or actions under the First Amendment. Um, it may be a piece of it, but it's not the most important piece. Uh, and I don't find it particularly helpful to think about like, is this activity or this action protected under the First Amendment? Instead, what I found to be the most helpful framework, anytime I'm in, in sort of approaching uh, a particular event or a particular set of behaviors to think about them in relation to the First Amendment, is to think about the First Amendment as a restriction on the government. This is a, a limit on the government's authority. And the government in this case means legislative bodies, means the police, it means school uh, officials, assistant principals, anybody who is a part of the government, anybody who works in public. Um, and it is a limitation, the First Amendment is a limitation on the government's authority to uh, interfere with activities engaged in by the public or by members of the public. Leave you with a quote from a case from 1972 uh, called Police Department of Chicago versus Mosley. U.S. Supreme Court said, above all else, the First Amendment means that the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. Which, if you think about the, the First Amendment as a limit on government authority, uh, those are some substantial limits. Uh, it does leave open to the public to largely police itself in the realm of ideas and expression. I think um, I say this as a, now I've been a, a First Amendment lawyer for almost 20 years. And part of the idea behind that work is the idea that the public left on its own, left unregulated, uh, will do the best job of sorting good ideas from bad, of sorting truth from false. Uh, and that's an idea I don't blindly follow. I find it's an idea that I have to uh, re-examine and re-interrogate. And current events in our country um, have certainly made me think about that idea and rethink about that idea and rethink my commitment to defending that idea. 
Uh, I still believe that it's true, but it's not because I've sort of blindly signed on or because my paycheck comes from the ACLU, I feel some obligation uh, to blindly sign on to that view. I do actually believe it's true, but it's a hard idea. If it's an idea that you all find yourself grappling with, uh, with difficulty, if you find it to be a problematic idea, then I, I share your um, view on that. And if there's any questions that I can answer or any uh, thoughts that you want to share on that subject, I'm happy to try to, to do so. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Mr. Hyden, thank you so much for being here with us. It's nice to see you. Um, and I would be happy to look around and see if there are any hands um, of counselors who'd like to ask questions or make comments. Councillor Pelletier. Hi. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and like none of what I say is directed at you. I'm just like, I have like a little bit of frustration. And I, maybe I feel like I misunderstood a little bit maybe too in terms of the workshop. Um, because, the, and this was very helpful and I do have a question for you, but I thought we were talking about specifically the, the neo-Nazi rally from April 1st and our immediate next steps for the public. Like, what do we do when this group comes back? And like, what steps can we take to show the public that we're hearing them? They gave two hours of public comment on how they didn't feel safe. Um, and how do we as a council create a framework within this body that's consistent messaging um, on our website or social media pages regarding violence and, and hate speech? So that's what I thought. And I know we're going into executive session, which is also tough because I know there are people that really want to, they're waiting for us to, to do something. They're, they've been waiting. It's been two months um, since this happened. I understand like it's hard to schedule things, but it's it has been two months. Um, and people are waiting for an answer from us. So I feel as though um, I just had to name that where this is a really helpful portion, but I also hope that we can have a deeper conversation about what are we gonna do next? Like what is the next step for the messaging and the, how do we as a council show up better for our community the next time that this group comes back? Because summertime is coming, it's already here. Pride is next is on Saturday, like they're gonna come back. And I just hope that we can have that conversation really honestly in this group of what we're gonna do to make sure that we are immediately able to show up for people so that they don't feel like they need to come in here and give two hours of emotional public comment, hoping we have an immediate response and we don't have an immediate response for them. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm frustrated. I mean, we I, yeah, I'm sure you know this. We you know we had a group of twenty people in masks coming to Portland and yelling the N word at Black people and doing the Hitler salute and holding a banner that said "Defend White Communities" and physically assaulting counter protests who were holding a pride flag. And I know that you talked about true threats and incitement. Um, and if I'm understanding what you said, a true threat would be the person would honestly believe that it is threatening conduct. Do I have that correct? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was just tough. Because it, I mean, like as a Black person, when I see a group of 20 to 30 white individuals in masks holding a banner that says defend white communities, specifically going to places like the Immigrant Welcome Center and City Hall, um, I feel like that is a true threat. I feel scared to walk around. I feel scared to be out there when a group is is saying defend white communities and do not want my existence in Portland or otherwise. So, but I'm feeling like what I'm hearing is that that's not actually a true threat and are true threats, like, is this just subjective? And are we just kind of benefiting from the fact that threats can be very, like you, the person who is giving the threat or receiving the threat, if it goes to court, it's up to the court to determine if that's really a, a threat. So I can say I feel threatened. But that doesn't, the, it, it's, even though I feel like it's a true threat, it may not be a true threat. And I, yeah, I just, I guess I want to know if, I, I would love to know your specific feedback on what happened. I don't know if you're able to share that, but if you think that these were categorized as threats or incitement, or if what happened um, was protected under the First Amendment and like what we now as counselors 
like what are we supposed to say to the community that's asking us for answers other than like that's the first amendment and that was a you know i don't know i'm kind of rambling now but i would love any feedback on that yeah i don't think i know enough to, to give you any um advice on whether that activity was a true threat whether it was incitement um i i really i've not um reviewed that I know that's something that you all have spent a lot of time reviewing that your your police department has reviewed and your attorney and, and they're probably in a better position to tell you uh, with about those specifics. Um, uh, you know, the, it just hasn't been something I'm, I'm mostly here just talking more generally about the First Amendment and the scope of the First Amendment uh, that may inform what you do in, in future acts actions, but I'm not sure it has much bearing on what happened already. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to think for a minute and I'll leave it up to my colleagues. Thank you, though. It was, it was very helpful. So I didn't want you to think that I was like, you know, having my energy towards you. Um, I really appreciate it. So thank you. And I just want to uh, add, Counselor, that I think that um, when we were putting this together, I think that it's difficult to talk about next steps if we don't know what the bumpers are. And we heard a lot from a lot of counselors talking about um, different you know, steps they wanted to take, different ordinances they wanted to pass and those types of things. And so getting a good broad understanding of the First Amendment, I think is really important for that discussion and that piece of it. And so having Zach come and talk about what those bumpers are and what it means, because I think the case law um, is, uh, sometimes can feel counterintuitive, but it's sort of like you were just talking about right there. Um, and I think that that was really, uh, really helpful, Zach, to lay that out and talk about, you know, maybe what you think obscenity is, not what the court thinks obscenity is. And so um, that's really, uh, it helps, in my mind at least, color the entire discussion because it helps you to be able to see where, where we where can we go? What can we do? And I think the second piece of this conversation is the piece we're going to have to have an executive session. And, and that is an important piece. So there are going to be some open things here. And I understand that that's unsatisfying, but really getting that framework out, I think was the most important piece. And um, I really appreciate you for, for helping us with that. Zach. Councillor Pelletier, are you all set for the moment? Okay. Councillor Trevorrow. Thank you. Thank you for coming and educating us. Um, what is hate speech under the law, or is it anything? It's really not much of anything under the law. It's not a legal term, um, you know, at least in terms of constitutional law. Um, I think there are hate speech um, criminal you know, pieces of things that are like hate speech statutes but it's not one of the categories that's used in First Amendment law to differentiate between types of activities that are expressly protected under the First Amendment or not protected under the First Amendment. That tends to be a framework that's more applied in the um, political arena and the social arena. People talk about hate speech, um, but it's not, it's not really a First Amendment category. And second question, I might have to talk my way through this one. Um, within the context of structural bias, which is present in, in communities and in our community, um, in, in the social world in which we live, a position of neutrality can actually sort of tip favor towards one side or the other. Are there examples where communities have kind of gotten creative within the law to counteract that effect? One example that comes to mind is, so just as a baseline idea, what I was talking about earlier was the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution applies everywhere in the United States. It provides the minimal level of protection. Um, states cannot provide less protection for expression than is provided in the First Amendment. 
but they can provide more protection. So there's an example of uh, a case from Washington, D.C., where a group of people were um, camped out in Lafayette Park, and they were camped out uh, for an extended amount of time. This is long before Occupy, but it was similar to Occupy and what people remember from, uh, from happening here in Portland, that people were engaged in uh, camping out outside and in the cold to demonstrate against homelessness. The case was called um, Community for Creative Nonviolence versus, I can't remember the name of the defendant. The courts said that that was not protected by the First Amendment, that camping out, expressive camping out, was not um, something that was protected under the First Amendment. But some states have said under their state constitutions that there's greater protection for um, expressive activities in public uh, and that that would fall within that state constitutional protection. So greater protection for expressive activity than is provided under the federal constitution to address that idea of structural imbalance, that um, this is about a, a particular economic disadvantage. The, the constitution has generally not been very helpful or protective of people uh, who are economically disadvantaged. It's a, you, often described as an instrument of uh, preserving the status quo uh, when it comes to economic relationships. But states have found greater protection in their state constitutions. And the same could be true of a municipality, right? A municipality could provide greater protection for expressive activity than is found in the state constitution or in the federal constitution. The thing that a state or a city can't do is provide less protection for expressive activity. Can, can I ask a quick follow up on that? So they could provide greater protections, but it would have to be across the board, going back to the other case that you mentioned, That's not right. based on content yes. or, yeah. That's okay. a great question. Yeah, a great point, Danielle, that it, you couldn't say we're going to only allow people to engage in expressive um, camping to demonstrate against homelessness, but not to demonstrate in favor of something uh, else. I don't know. I can't think of another cause. Thank you. You're all set. Okay, great. Councilor Dion. Thank you. Good to see you, Zach. Good to see you, Sheriff. I'm not a sheriff here. Don't worry about that. Yeah. They remind me every day. I, listen, I, I want to be clear about this because to me, we're going to skate out on some thin ice. Clearly, the testimony that we all heard on one particular evening was attested to the emotional trauma that many of our residents experience as a consequence of alleged criminal act that rose and exclusive to act to exclude rather than invite in. And the standard response is this is part of the political marketplace. Right, so I, I'd like you, if you can, is to address the level of tolerance, and that's not a use I often apply, but I think it, it makes sense here, that the public has to have a certain level of tolerance to let the marketplace sort out these ideas. My concern is um, the suggestion that a municipality could engage in a First Amendment ordinance structure that would act to exclude groups and their speech simply because on this given day, I don't happen to agree with them. And I'm, that's kind of being facetious almost. I mean, clearly, I don't think anybody around this semicircle would endorse any kind of Nazi type organization. But at the same time, in reference to your earlier comment, it's difficult for me to accept the fact that they have to be granted space, that they can't be excluded or barred. And the question is, how do we manage the spaces between they and those that they intend to be the recipients, the true recipients of their message, both in terms of victimization? I mean, they know they're hurting people when they say what they say. And in terms of soliciting others into their fold, 
I think it's the most difficult thing for government to manage. And I, I want to be clear that it's just not a question of, okay, we're going to pass an ordinance and we're going to make it real tight so they have no way to come in here and express themselves because it is a limitation on what we can do, not a green light to expand this idea of constitutional intervention. So if you could comment on that, that would be helpful. Right. And I, you know, where I began, I think I'll sort of go back to that, that this is not um, speaking to you all as, as a government body. You're, you're here and your power as a you know, governing body of this, the largest city in the state, um, which is very different than your authority as a citizen um, and your responsibilities as a citizen. So you as a government, body you as a police chief you know have one set of limit you know the first amendment is a limit on you a limit on what you can do as a government body but it is not a limit on you uh, as um, as a citizen as a member of the community and in fact what it carries with it is an obligation um, not to tolerate but to loudly um, shout down and to loudly counter protest. Uh, and in particular, uh, for people like me, who are white and have a lot of privilege in this society, uh, it carries even more of an obligation to uh, protest against uh, people who would use their speech to demean or to harm or to threaten. I don't want to misconstrue how I apply the word tolerate. I, I only raise it because in the marketplace of ideas, there are some who subscribe to the idea that, that if there is an expression that they would experience as racially divisive or assaultive against some manner of identity, that the police should be compelled to intervene and criminalize that. And that's, I'm saying, I hear things often that I don't agree with, I don't like it, but I'm not in a position to suggest the mechanics of government intervene. I may, as a citizen, either tolerate and ignore it, write a letter to the editor, organize a counter rally, or any manner of strategies. And th that's why I was talking about tolerate. Um, you've got to hear it, incorporate it, decide what's the next best step, but it doesn't necessarily mean a green light for the police to make an immediate law intervention simply because you experienced it so adversely. Thank you. Any comment there before we move on? No, oh, okay, Councillor Fournier. Thank you, and thank you so much for being here. Um, so putting aside what we've gone through, um, because we can't change the past. Obviously we can learn from it and of course do better. So one thing I'm very mindful of is this coming weekend, we have our pride parade that's going to happen here that I'm incredibly excited for um, to be able to march in it and to celebrate our community. And so one of the things I think that you mentioned with true threats is, and I, I just pulled up the ACLU definition because I couldn't keep that in my brain because it's been a long week and it's only Monday. Um, so what, what it says is, um, the government can prosecute someone who intentionally threatens another person with death or serious bodily harm and whose language is reasonably perceived as threatening. And so today's Monday, we know this is happening on Saturday. And so from this point up until the pride parade happens on Saturday, if there are individuals in the community like NSC 131, like others who have been marching around with, um, you know, white lives matter to type signs. Is that something that we're able to address or something that we're able to perceive as a true threat because their intent is to intimidate and to call others to create harm at this event? Yeah, the, the First Amendment requires and, and the, specifically the interaction of the First Amendment and criminal law requires a lot of specificity. It doesn't, it, it's very hard to, to analyze in the abstract. It's especially difficult before the speech has happened to try to think of like, what, what is this group intending or what do they mean to do um, before, before it takes place? Um, 
you know, after the fact, you can go back and um, try to look at the speech and the effect that it had, and you can um, discern what a person's specific intent was, if that turns out to be uh, something that the Supreme Court requires in the Counterman case. Um, but it's hard in the abstract to say, oh, this, you know, you can go after this group because they have a history of engaging in hateful speech or they have expressed uh, antipathy towards particular groups. Councillor Phillips. Yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'll probably be all over the place because I've heard a lot of, of different things from you and a lot of other people. Uh, for me, the difference is, is that um, this group is known to use hate speech and then escalate that to violence. Yeah. And so when we talk about definitions, right? So you talked about defamation, you talked about true threats, um, you talked about um, incitement. All of those are leading up to this group inciting violence. And they're inciting violence against folks that look like me, right? And so given this whole situation with it, what happened on April 1st, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts. Some that we after executive station still will not be clear on what happened because it really depends on who works that day, uh, what the situation is um, and all those stuff. So we can't, you know, we'll get some clarity, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna be completely comfortable with everything that I learned tonight regarding this situation, which brings me back to free speech. And so <clears throat> again, I, I hear you when you say, um, that everybody has uh, that right to free speech. Uh, I certainly don't want us to go down that pathway of trying to figure out was this free speech or it wasn't. Um, I'm still back at, uh, it may sound a little corny, but hurt, words hurt. Um, and um, it, for me, there, there um, is a level of, of what those words are. Um, and so when you talk about defamation, call it, I, I, I'm gonna be straight with you because I always have, right? Um, but calling somebody a nigger is not, to me, free speech. A calling somebody a faggot is not free speech. At that point in time, somebody to me has crossed the line and I totally get where you're going with this. But I also understand that it's on a case by case basis because you just said there's a case going in front of the Supreme Court that we don't know what's going to happen. So for me, all of those times and in all of those situations, I don't care what happens after. What I care about is holding that person accountable so that they know, number one, we're watching them. They know that we're not going to tolerate it. They know that we are going to do everything we can in order for, to protect everyone, including me, and including other people that are in a disenfranchised community so that we they don't incite violence. And so I don't really have a question other than it's really extremely frustrating. Everybody has a right to free speech. I can't control that. Nobody can control that. But when your free speech again turns into something violent, then, then I, I think we need to look at that. And, and I know, again, we're gonna go into executive session um, and, and we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, but there are words to me um, that are not about free speech. And every time that is heard in our city, whether somebody is criminalized for that or not, we need to react. There's a, there's a wonderful book. I'll just say is sort of a baseline the presentation that I'm here to give to you tonight is descriptive. I'm telling you what the law is. It's not normative. I'm not saying what I wish the law was, what I think the law should be. Uh, I'm telling you about the cases as I understand them that, that have already been decided and what those mean, how you can put those together as doctrine. But if you're interested in a, in a normative view of free speech, there's a book that you might like called Words That Wound. It goes into exactly what you're talking about with words that themselves, people, scholars that have thought about this a lot, believe um, are themselves direct threats. Just the use of those words. It's by uh, Mari Matsuda and Charles Lawrence. 
Uh, it's a, sort of associated with the, the critical legal uh, theory um, movement, um, and um, they, you know, or take they take issue. And, and Charles Lawrence has come and spoken to my group at, at our conferences and takes issue with uh, some of the cases that we've done and said, you know, this is how the First Amendment should develop in a different way. And the way that it's developed, the neutrality on the basis of subject and viewpoint, uh, and uh, uh, is not is not desirable. Is not leading to societal good. So. Um, yeah, they, they are. They share your views on that. Councilor Ali. Oh, thank you, Mia. I have a question. It's uh, 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 I'm going to make up something, but in line of what I want to ask, and actually to probably two or three scenarios. Uh, this building, um, it's the building that house the city government and the city administration. So by, to some extent, it's a public property. Um, if I know that there is an individual who is from the protective groups that works here, and I know that if I paste something in front of the building, um, it will intimidate the person emotionally, and maybe the person may not come to work. Then I come in in the day that I know, and there's only one entrance, and I post anti whatever group the person is from. Will that be considered as a free speech, and is it protected by free speech? Um, I, as you've described it, it doesn't seem to me that that would qualify as a threat, as a true threat under the true threat doctrine, um, which. But but maybe there are facts that could make it more of a true threat if it was clearly identifying this person and clearly aimed at harming a person and any objective viewer would regard it as intending to harm a person, then it might be characterized as a true threat. Uh, whereas if it is more of a generalized statement about a person's characteristics about their race or ethnicity or religion, um, that applies more generally and isn't isn't specific and targeted, then I think it would be less likely to be characterized as a true threat and more likely to be found as um, as protected under the First Amendment. Well, if that's that's helpful way of analyzing or answering a question, but it's uh, if you know it sounds sort of lawyerly, I guess that's <laughs> a occupational hazard. Yeah. Uh, what if that building? I give an example of this building as a public as public space. Yes. What if that structure uh, is a private uh, property owned by that somebody from that group? I mean, I don't think that would matter necessarily. That that a person, if you're if you're engaging in a threat in a true threat, somebody could be engaged. You know, somebody could be the object of a true threat anywhere in a private space, in a public space. So I don't know that that fact is, is particularly important for First Amendment perspective. Thank you. Sure. That answered my other question, so. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, next, back to Councillor Dion. Zach, I was gonna use Councillor Ali's uh, hypothetical, because I think it's instructive mm -hmm. insofar as my understanding of what he described would be evidence of a bias incident as opposed to a bias crime. And sometimes there's confusion between the two, yet where you may see the police are hamstrung initiating a bias crime investigation, they could, on the other hand, conduct a bias incident documentation process to inform the attorney general and others of at least an environmental issue that's attached to certain individuals that need bears watching, for lack of a better term. I haven't done good with terms tonight, so I'll have to be careful. But could you comment on that if you feel comfortable as to how Maine law, if at all, makes that distinction between bias incident and a actual bias crime? Yeah, I, I think your distinction is helpful. The other, the, the other sort of layer of it is um, we're mostly talking about this in the context of criminal law, but there's obviously other forms of law. There's civil enforcement. Uh, so somebody might engage in a pattern of 
behavior um, in a school, in a place of public accommodation, in a, in a credit arena that is um, carried out by acts of speech, uh, but that is uh, preventing somebody from accessing that space uh, in a way that might violate the Maine Human Rights Act. And the, so the state law that prohibits discrimination on, on a number of categories. Uh, so that could be also a way that um, discriminatory acts are addressed, even though those acts are carried out uh, by use of signs or um, text messages or, or letters or any of the other ways that people have engaged in discriminatory conduct. Other questions, comments, Councillor Azaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. In fact, thank you for the presentation. I feel like I'm back in grad school. Um, this has been exceedingly academic and cerebral and it's useful, but also it's challenging because we obviously can't speak to the, the specific incident that I, I think brings us all here this evening. This is, we don't typically have this sort of conversation um, at the Portland City Council. Um, I guess my question for you is you cited the what, 1969 Ohio case about incitement. Right. Um, I'm curious though, I'm going to be careful. You'd be my guardrails. Um, at what point, if uh, there's you know, protest, counter protest, freedom of speech, both people have that access, right? That's our right. One tries to impede the other and, they, and, and therefore prohibit their access mm. to their First Amendment right of free speech and expression. And, and what, what happens there? What is that? What, what I'm asking is where's the handoff where we go from? constitutional law, First Amendment to criminal law, when there's an act of violence, when there is something that has now stopped, you know, someone from having, whether it's an assault, which would be criminal or, you know, an impediment to their own, their own free speech. Yeah, that's a great question. Protests and counter protests. This is often the case, uh, specifically with events that are sort of planned ahead of time and that people know about ahead of time. There's often uh, a counter protest group. And sometimes the counter protest is larger than the original protest. Um, and in those circumstances, the police have an obligation to keep the group separate. The general understanding under the First Amendment law is that they have to be sort of within sight of each other, that you're denying people the right to protest or counter protest if they're not able to, to see each other, but need to be kept. Um, a, you know, far enough apart where they can um, safely express themselves, right? Freedom of expression is supposed to be a peaceful act, not supposed to be, you know, it's not supposed to lead to blows. If that seems like that makes a, you know, imposes a lot of challenges on the police department, yeah, it does. It's pretty difficult. Um, I'll tell you about a case actually involving that. I don't know how many of you know Susan Finer, used to teach over here at USM. Um, Susan's father, Irving, was involved in a very famous U.S. Supreme Court case called Finer versus New York. Uh, he was standing on a street corner in Syracuse, New York in 1949, and he was saying all sorts of uh, incitement sort of things. He said that Harry Truman is a bum and the mayor of Syracuse is a bum. And this is 1949. This is what, you know, it's really inflammatory. And a crowd gathered around and they were very worked up calling the president a bum. And uh, the police didn't know what to do. So they arrested Irving Finer they, um, and charged him with incitement and said that he, you know, he had created this violent situation. The reaction of the crowd was directly attributable to his speech, even though they were not in agreement with him, they were quite vocally disagreeing with his views about the mayor and the president. Uh, and they arrested him and they charged him with these, these two counts. And his case went all the way up to the US Supreme Court. Uh, and the US Supreme Court said, um, the, the, you can't blame the speaker when people for people's reactions. And this is so, what's sometimes known as the heckler's veto uh, doctrine. You can't hold, uh, you can't allow people to, you know, violently, loudly disagree and then hold that against the speaker simply because the speaker provokes um, a strongly held reaction that the police needed to do more, uh, engage in more non-punitive measures to keep the group separate 
so that there wasn't violence, but allow the speech to continue. And that's Finer versus, um, you know, Finer ultimately was the U.S. Supreme Court found him guilty, and you know, upheld that that conviction. And then years later, that that doctrine, the the heckler's veto doctrine, was uh, abandoned. Thank you. That's it. Zach, I have a quick question. Um, you just spoke about the um, the right of a protester and a counter protester, and we've had this situation many times in Portland, and um, they're in the same vicinity, and the police has you know presence and kind of awareness. Um, but you talked a little bit about that desire, I guess, to keep a separation so that it doesn't. Uh, uh, um, escalate to violence. And so I'm wondering if you can talk uh, about that more um, for us to understand, because so many times we see that the two groups are unable to be kept separate. And then things can escalate into a situation where you go beyond the rights of free speech and actually into assault or criminal behavior. Um, and I imagine if you've got dozens and dozens or even hundreds of protesters and a handful of police, that's kind of an impossible situation. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about that a little bit and what, just, yeah, just talk about it a little bit because it seems to me like a very, um, it's a tricky situation and we've seen escalation a lot in the last few years um, and, and well beyond that, but just I'm thinking the last few years here in Portland where um, situations have escalated. Yeah, it, it is a difficult situation. I wish I could tell you, oh, no, there's some easy things you can do. There really isn't very much that's easy. The best, um, the best case scenario is that demonstrations are planned in advance or rallies are planned in advance. The First Amendment provides protection for spontaneous demonstrations uh, in response to breaking news. A decision comes down from a court uh, or a something happens, a pol politician says something, and people want to spontaneously take to the streets. Uh, in response to that, that's protected under the First Amendment. But, uh, you know, far better is when people can plan ahead of time and to work with city government and the police of here's where our route's going to be, here's how many people we're expecting, um, you know, here's what maybe we might ex anticipate in terms of counter protests. And that's you know been generally understood for for many years that when people are planning activities, uh, it's best to try to do as much planning ahead of time and to work with government officials to let everyone know what's happening so that so that people can be kept separate. That these are supposed to be peaceful events, uh, you know, even speeches that are uh, supposed to elicit strong feelings. If somebody is engaging in expressive activity within the framework of First Amendment protections, uh, it's supposed to be peaceful. And so working ahead of time to try to make those arrangements uh, maximizes the chances of those being peaceful events, though it doesn't guarantee it. Uh, I mean, there's no guarantees for that. Zach, can you just comment quickly on um, Section 1983 and 1988? Um, and just about some of the implications of that, just because um, I know that we, uh, when we're dealing with a lot of situations here in the city, uh, specifically, you're talking about the interplay of the First Amendment and police officers' actions, uh, those, those two provisions of federal law do come into play, and I think it's just important to sort of ground us in those. We do. So Section 1983 is the federal civil rights law. It's um, actually a, a part of a, a statute that was passed in the wake of the Civil War, one of the Reconstruction Civil Rights Laws that is still on the books. It um, makes government officials, uh, when they're acting in their official government role, uh, to violate somebody's rights that are guaranteed by the federal constitution or guaranteed by some other uh, federal statute, liable. Uh, they can be held accountable. They can be made to pay monetary damages. They can be subject to injunctive relief or declaratory relief. And then Section 1988 is a related law that also says that that, that person, if they're found guilty of violating somebody's rights, can have to pay attorney fees to the, the person whose rights they violated or to their attorney. 
Um, and this is the most powerful tool that civil rights advocates use to vindicate people's civil rights. Uh, it is the law that I use the most, uh, you know, in my in my work. Whenever I'm trying to bring a federal case, uh, the very first case that I brought as an ACLU lawyer was against the city of Augusta on behalf of a group that was uh, anti-war protesters that wanted to hold a march down. Um, Western Avenue in, in protesting the Iraq war and the Iraq war invasion. Um, and the city had restrictions in place uh, that would have prevented that group from holding their march. They had a, a requirement that, this, that the group get insurance uh, that they couldn't afford. They were just a group of small group of anti-war protesters. So we, we brought a suit. We asked the court under 1983 to say that these restriction violated the Constitution violated their First Amendment rights, and uh, we were partially successful in that case. Thanks. I just wanted to, to ground us in that because that does come into play, I think, with a lot of the situations that we're talking about when we think about, you know, different actions that may or may not be taken. I think it's sort of an umbrella that's always over a lot of government officials, including police officers, in their minds. Um, if I'm going to be found personally liable for my actions in a situation and have to pay attorney's fees and um, go through all of that. Um, so that's always something that's there. And I, I think that that, when I think about our ordinances specifically in place with regard to um, events like protests, and I know I think Gary maybe had worked with you at one point on, on reworking that ordinance, Gary Wood, former city attorney, and and that ordinance specifically has a lot of triggers in it, but it has a lot of um, relaxed provisions specifically to allow the First Amendment on both sides of the issue to allow people to be able to protest and to be able to articulate their viewpoints um, in, in easy ways and, and to also give notice to the police. But I think what's complicated is it also says that if you're going to, if your event would trigger 25 or less people to come to it, that no, no notice is required. And I think that's good in certain instances. If you're trying to do something last minute, it does help. Um, but I think in this case, that's exactly the provision that was in place. So that notice that Zach was just talking about was not present. So it may, the, I think those are just a couple of factors to always keep in the back of your head. We have a lot of great ordinances on the books that have been reworked and thought about in the context of all the things that has been discussing. Um, but it does make uh, the police officers involved, their lives uh, more complicated in every situation, but it also allows for certain things to happen, like no notice in this case, which also complicates the situation. Um, and I just want to keep us all sort of on the same uh, grounded playing field when we're thinking about that and thinking about ways in which we move forward from here. Thank you, uh, Councillor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, question for the manager. Um, walk me through what procedurally, what would happen if someone triggered the ordinance and there was 26 people? What happens? <laughs> there was, there would not be, I mean, we haven't, uh, I don't think uh, enforcement wise we've ever triggered um, had an issue like that. We do uh, try to work with everybody who is organizing an event and come in after the fact um, and try to say, hey, next time, <laughs> if, you, if you think you're going to have 50 people, you need to go through this process. And so we make sure uh, so that we do get the notice and that the appropriate um, staff is involved and that the appropriate people are notified, including the police, whether it's a protest or a rally or um, even just an event in a park that's going to bring a bunch of people. So we try to work with event organizers across the board. Well, that's helpful to know. In theory, though, just to say, hey, next time, you know, you need to have a permit, would they have to be ID'd? Would you have to know who they are? Um, I mean, we do have certain provisions in place. Uh, some of the ones that Zach mentioned that Augusta have, we do have for certain events when they're big, large festivals, we require insurance and those types of things. But um, we do have a specific category for what we've labeled First Amendment events. Those don't uh, trigger fees. They don't trigger a lot of the specific requirements under the ordinance. So um, it's a very intricate set of rules uh, that, that the events group here in the city always manages and keeps a good handle on. And there's a significant number of departments that are involved in that, that review all of those permits that go in, notify everyone. We get the notice out. Um, you know, sometimes those events get 
uh, are put on our calendar so other members of the public know about them as well. Um, so there is a lot, uh, a lot of process that happens. And, and that's, we, we like process. It helps things, you know, make sense. I think what I'm trying to get at is, and this is an interesting, this is kind of maybe where some of that tension is where we're talking about the first amendment. It's the anonymity. It's the unknown. It's the, I don't know who you are. Your face is covered. That is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, uh, and I don't know if there's a remedy for it, but that's, I think, a part of this. Thank you. Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayo. I have a question. Uh, can we be specific? Oh, we can just, it has to be. Ask the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we may be going into executive session. That is why I'm asking. Uh, it, I think it, because we're going to into executive session to discuss um, the April 1st incident, I, I would I would suggest not asking specific questions about that event. So if it's a different event, I can ask. If it has nothing to do with April 1st, but it is about... I think that's fine. Okay, thank you. So um, if one group is organizing an event and... Um, they do. They did everything that the city asked them to do, and then on the day of the event, someone who do not agree with them attend that event, hold their flag across the street, and then slowly and eventually they keep walking slowly and getting close to uh, uh, the group that have. Uh, apply for permit and the permit is being granted and then they find themselves right in the middle of the group holding a flag that they know is going to intimidate this group and started fighting with people not physically but verbally yelling at people right in the middle of another group is that considered as a free speech and is that protected yeah that's a that's a difficult question. Um, in general, the way that demonstration public speech law works is that the sort of first in time, right? I've We've reserved Monument Square. That's where our group is gonna be on Friday at noon. And, and you know, the basic laws of physics, two people cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Somebody else is gonna have to get that next week, right? They're gonna, we've, we've got that space. We've signed up for it, but the First Amendment also protects the rights of protesters and counter protesters. They, they have a right to be within sight of one another. Um, it's going to be, we get it quickly into the area of fact specific of how much um, is that creating a danger of somebody getting hurt versus how much uh, is it simply that people are uncomfortable. Uh, you know, people are uncomfortable because they're being exposed to a viewpoint that's different than theirs. Um, that's generally part of what, you know, the First Amendment protects and contemplates that that's going to be about when people are expressing themselves in public, they may encounter people uh, very close up even uh, who have different views, uh, but that they're, the line is really about violence threats to people's lives or their safety, and, and particularly imminent threats is a term that's important in the law, that this is something that's going to erupt in violence right away. And obviously the best management is to try to keep people at a, at a safe distance if there's a, if there's a possibility of violence, but part of the experience of, of engaging in public speech is that you will encounter people who feel differently. You know, um, when I was growing up, we have something that we say to when you are in a classroom, like elementary school, middle, uh, yeah. The teacher will say that your freedom to do something ends at the length of your nose. So we as a municipal government, can we put something in place? Um, that is close to what I just shared about my elementary school teacher saying that um, if I stretch my hands, my right, my right to speak, to touch, to do whatever ends where my hand is. If I touch someone's hand or I get closer to someone's nose, 
then I'm breaking the classroom's rules. I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. All right. I, it's a better question for, you know, your lawyer to answer, but I... Okay. I, my instinct is, as you've described it, this hypothetical, it's... All right. That would be hard to regulate. Oh, I asked three of my lawyers already, so... <laughs> So Zach, you talked you talk about um, peaceful, you know that that competing free speech is protected, it's allowed, it potentially can be encouraged, um, but it ought to be it needs to be peaceful. And I think it's so hard and unsatisfying to think about um, the term peaceful when what you've got, are potentially two groups with very, very different views who are screaming at one another, right? It doesn't feel peaceful at all. It feels violent. Um, the words feel violent. The rhetoric may be violent um, in nature and hateful. And, and you know, so, so I'm just trying to square that and, and think, of, I mean, maybe what I'm doing is thinking aloud and, and inviting you to talk a little bit about this, but as a municipal government, what can be really hard as we think about our role as policymakers is how do we live within that place which is we uphold people's right to free speech we uphold people's right to peaceful demonstrations protests rally um but we understand that um words on social media words on texts in emails in the in any kind of media and and right out here in front of city Paul can be so incredibly violent, hurtful, awful, and destructive. So how do I square the notion of peaceful with all of that that can come from people's signs and out of their mouths and from the things they carry? That's a great question. I think the word peaceful in this context does not mean peaceful in a way that we hope that our homes are peaceful or the way that we hope that our workplaces are peaceful or that we hope our you know dinner conversations with our friends are peaceful uh, rather thinking back to where i was talking about earlier with obscenity that laws words in law have very specific meanings and peaceful in the context of law in the context of, of free speech um, really just simply means the absence of violence and the absence of violence um, since the mere absence of violence is not what we would collect, collectively, colloquially call peaceful. Um, and in fact, the idea of, of public expression is that it is intended to excite emotions. It's intended to provoke um, feelings, not just thoughts, but feelings. Uh, it's in, intended to engage with people um, at a deep level. Uh, a colleague of mine who does First Amendment laws says that you, you don't need the First Amendment. You don't need protection in the Constitution for the ideas that we already agree on. You don't need it for things that are um, generally inoffensive or non-controversial um, or for views that are lightly felt. The First Amendment exists rather as a limit on government bodies' authorities, on a limit on police authority, on the limit of um, school officials' authority. For, for at times when the desire to exercise that authority, that desire to censor, is the most strong. Now, um, you know, I, I know some of you. I don't know all of you. I would guess that we all agree on a lot of public policy matters um, and that our our views and values are probably the same. But I have the benefit of being a part of this national organization. That's not the case for all of my colleagues all over the country, right? They're, they're dealing with the government officials who feel very differently um, about um, racial minorities, about immigrants, uh, about people who are transgender. Uh, they're not spending a whole lot of time thinking about how to make their cities more welcoming for asylum seekers or um, 
finding better places uh, for people who are homeless to live. Rather, they're trying to think of ways to uh, punish those people or discourage them from coming to live in their cities. And that's the First Amendment uh, protection that, that we're talking about here applies with just as much force to those government bodies as it does to this one. And I think that's an important um, characteristic of it that's sort of stands in counterbalance to that desire, which we'd all feel about peacefulness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's helpful. Sure. Other questions or comments from the council? Okay, I'm gonna turn it, I think over to, who should I turn it over to? Michael, Danielle? Well, I think the next step is to go into executive session. Um, I think the citation is in your in your materials, and so we would need a motion and a second. It would take public comment unless Michael has some additional information. No, just before we do that, I just would want to thank Zach and um, yeah, you were you were, you gave us a lot of your time, and we really appreciate it, and a lot of a lot of helpful information. I think so. I really appreciate you coming. Thank you, yep. Zach. Yep. Thank you very much for being here. Councilor, oh, oh, um, and thank you also to um, Michael Goldman for making sure that we had expert um, input tonight uh, for, for this workshop. Um, so at this time, I'm looking for a motion to go into executive session pursuant to one MRSA section 4056F to discuss the Portland Police Department after action report regarding the April 1, 2023 rally. Before I take that motion, though, I'm going to ask if there's any public comment on the motion to go into executive session. Hi, Zach Bearer, it's Hunter Street, Portland. Uh, I first have a sort of point of order um, in that the reason for, um, stated reason for the executive session was the confidentiality of a um, criminal uh, investigation. Uh, as such, I don't think it is in order to limit any of the questions by the counselors um, in the workshop that just, um, seated um, that is not that is relevant to the April 1st event uh, that came up. Uh, in terms of the uh, executive session, um, I think that this workshop was was interesting from a sort of uh, what do they call it a 10,000 square foot view. Um, and it's really reaffirmed my um, in belief that this is not, uh, that there were no, um, everyone was, was in their rights, their First Amendment rights of free speech, uh, the, the rights of free speech were duly, um, duly um, protected. Uh, I don't, what I would have liked to have seen today was a criminal lawyer, because what I saw was on April 1st, the crime, or well, several crimes. I saw assault well, I, in, in video. I saw battery. I saw theft uh, of, a, of a banner. Um, there was um, one thing, and I appreciate that Councillor Zaro and, and Mayor Schneider picked up on this, um, that on the ACLU website, it says, police may treat protesters and counter-protesters must treat, I don't have my glasses, police must treat protesters and counter-protesters equally. Police are permitted to keep antagonistic groups separated, but should allow them within sight and sound of one another. Clearly, this not, did not happen. And clearly, this should have happened. And the question is, why didn't this happen? And I think this is something that should be spoken about in a public session. 30, se 30 seconds and not in executive session. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Trying to keep time here. Um, and uh, thank you, just a reminder that we're, the public comment is specific to the motion to go into executive session. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councilors, and I will do my best to keep my comments pertinent to the, the motion on the floor. Um, I'm here tonight because uh, I've waited a really long time um, for this meeting, and I'm really disappointed in the content of this uh, workshop so far. I think uh, I agree with the previous commenter and a number of counselors that this is academically interesting and pertinent, 
Um, however, I want to know what the action plan is. I want to know what the next steps the council is going to take are. And um, maybe what I'm learning from this meeting is that the council is not prepared and the city is not prepared to defend people like me, people so, um, who um, are threatened in our city from um, impending fascist threats. So with that in mind, um, uh, I would love you to vote down this motion and continue the workshop um, to discuss the matter as it was presented in the agenda, um, to discuss the events of April 1st and not to hide behind uh, a state law that allows you to um, shelter yourselves um, in this executive session um, so that the police can deliver their report behind closed doors when I and countless others had to stand up here using our legal names um, in front of the city council and anybody who wants to tune in on Zoom to go into the public record to tell about our experiences on that day. Um, the events happened. We know they happened. I want to know what the police observed. I understand there's an ongoing criminal um, investigation, and I believe that there are facts that are not pertinent to that investigation that would be illuminating to the council and to the members of the community that can be discussed publicly in this meeting. And I would highly encourage the um, police or any representatives um, from the district attorney's office to share those facts with us in this community and not behind closed doors. Um, as some members of the council were so um, helpful to point out, uh, I'm really worried about pride next week. Um, there are guys in our community who are um, actively making um, maybe not true threats, but threats of some sort towards queer people like me, my comrades who are going to be out there on Saturday. And um, to be totally honest, after I was physically assaulted in front of City Hall for holding a pride flag, and the city council has done nothing to, no, no statement, no comment about um, that kind of threat, and instead has spent um, hours and hours of my time and the community's time uh, with legal fictions to try to understand. 30 seconds. Free speech. I, I'm quite frustrated, and I really appreciate um, that you're all here um, and willing to listen and that I can use this public comment. But um, I am worried that if you listen to what the police have to say behind closed doors, they're going to feed you a lot of stuff that is simply untrue and that people in the community will not have the opportunity to debunk and help you to understand why those facts are simply not true. There were two harms that were caused. Mayor, may I have another moment, please? Thank you, and, and we'll just keep it specific to the motion to go into executive session, please. Yes. Um, there were two harms that were caused. Um, there was the fascist attack, and there was the um, neglect by the police department to um, act on that threat and that attack. And it is really pertinent to our community that we hear specifically from the police about their decision-making process in public. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there additional public comment on the motion to go into executive session? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and I'll ask for a motion from the council, please. Councilor Ali with a motion, Councilor Dion with a second. Um, and we do not have our clerk with us this evening. So am I good? To, so do we have discussion on the motion to go into executive session? Councilor Fournier? Thank you. I just have two quick questions and I might have spaced this out at the beginning and I apologize. The transition from one meeting to the next was a little bit for my brain. Um, and so I guess to, to the public's point, and I think we've gotten also a couple of emails is the reason that this is going into executive session because it's a personnel matter on pending litigation or I guess help me understand. No, it's and Michael could speak to that. It's about an active criminal investigation involving the incident himself, itself. So we're protecting the, the investigation that's going on at the district attorney's office right now into the rally and the protesters that were there and potential for um, criminal conduct cases that have come out of that. Nothing to do with anything related to personnel. Um, and so then my next question is um, really what are the next steps to share the results of what we've found so far of the incident as far as what did we do right, what did we do wrong, how do we fix it for next time, considering we have another giant event that is likely to create the same type of situation coming up on Saturday. Unfortunately, due to that active criminal investigation, we can't share the specifics of the report. Um, and so that is that's sort of the pickle we're in right now. 
Um, but we have, uh, you know, I think the chief has spoken to it too. Obviously they're well aware of um, the situation and have um, taken and continue to take uh, significant precautions and are prepared for this weekend. Um, and we've been talking about it and he and I have checked in on it. There are um, additional measures that they're taking. Obviously we don't wanna reveal any sort of tactical decision-making or information, but that would be something that the, the police is well prepared for it. I know that they um, would be able to speak to that more generally. Um, and last question, do we have any sort of timeline on the investigation about when this would wrap up and when we would be able to give any sort of update to the public? Because I, 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 I don't, that's um, governed by more of the criminal court system and, and that, that process. Um, and so I don't have a specific timeline. I'm looking at both of the Chief, Chief, do you have a specific? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pelletier. Thank you. My question, my one of my questions was similar to Councillor Fournier, so I got answered. But I guess I'm wondering, are we after the criminal investigation has been completed? Like, are we not able to have another workshop until that investigation has been completed? Like, are we at a pause until the investigation? We, we wouldn't be able to reveal anything with the report or anything along those lines until that's done. Um, as my understanding, there's a there's a statute, Michael. What is the statute? I know you have all the specific. I'm, I'm actually going to look to to uh, uh, Nicole Albert, who's here as well. Do do you have a response for that, Nicole? Is there a is there a point in time where the confidentiality is lifted on a report like this? <laughs> Could you step to the mic, please? Thank you. <laughs> He's also louder than I am. Um, my name is Nicole Albert, and I work for uh, the Office of Corporation Counsel. Um, it, and probably what's more important is that I was an assistant district attorney before I took this job. So I'm very intimately familiar with the criminal justice process. And unfortunately, I can't it really depends on what happens with any criminal case, whether it's pursued, whether it's not pursued. Um, there are statutes governing dissemination of information. For instance, if a case doesn't go forward, if the district attorney's office decides not to prosecute, there are severe limitations under main statutes on what we can and can't um, even, we can't even talk about the fact that there was a criminal case. Um, so I don't, unfortunately, it really is very, dependent on what happens next. And that could take a bit. The courts are backlogged, as I'm sure all of you know. So if the case does go forward and it's charged, it would have to work its way through the criminal justice process. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councilor Pelletier, you have the floor. So we have no, we just have no timeline at all, I guess, just because of it's backlogged. And I don't know who I'm asking, I'm sorry. I'm just, we just, we don't know how long that would, like, could that take anywhere from six months to like two years? Is that the time frame we're talking about? I would say two years is probably long, but it could take six months for sure. Okay. Or longer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I guess my question is, are we able to have another workshop while we wait for this piece of information to talk about as a council, how we're going to make sure that this we are prepared if this doesn't happen again. I, I guess I'm, um, I'm, I think that was why the bumpers were here. I think that we have ordinances on the books. I'm happy to have those discussions with the council about what would be your policy ideas, if you have any that are within some of those bumpers. But I think that um, we have, it's like we already have the, the uh, tools there, um, and then moving forward with uh, the you know the next steps after the the criminal piece, there are certain things that we'll be working on with um, with the the staff and trying to address those training pieces if there's anything that's necessary there. Um, the chief and I have had a discussion with the district attorney's office, uh, spoken with her about what um, how she. Uh, how she views these types of situations in these cases and trying to take that information in and educate ourselves um, on that front. Um, but other than that, I think the policy's next steps, if there were changes or tweaks that the council wanted to make, that would really be within um, your purview. And I would defer 
defer to, to you all and in, in, in suggestions on ways in which you would want to address that. So I think I'm hearing you say, yes, we could get into workshop to talk about policy initiatives. I, I guess I, I am, but I'm I'm careful to say that I, I think that some of that would have to be uh, fleshed out and what we were specifically talking about, but happy to have that discussion with you all. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's that's helpful. I just, I've, I'm getting just like a significant amount of people asking me what just like what's what's next and they're waiting and I just feel like it's a, it's just frustrating and this is helpful to hear like that we could potentially talk about something while we're waiting for this report and maybe that's something with um that like Umaro can be a part of as well with some of his work so I would love for us to do that and actually have him here as because that will fall into a lot of his expertise around racial equity and so I I would love for us to have a another conversation potentially another uh like a listening session or public comments just because people are yeah people are just waiting for us to have an answer that's more concrete than this and um it's just tough so yeah and even going to an executive session feels like procedurally I don't know it just feels like we are now going to have like a really significant conversation that people want to know about in, in an environment where they can't know about it so yeah thank you thank you uh Councillor Rodriguez and then Councillor Dion thank you Mayor um <clears throat> so I guess um I, I understand that we cannot discuss anything that's pertinent to the um, open investigation um but what I'm what I think I'm hearing from the public and what we've heard um, in, 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 in calls for our transparency, um, and I, I guess the discussion about potential policy that the council can take on is not necessarily where my mind was going as to what the public wants to hear. Um, if there were, for example, you know, from the department themselves, like new SOPs or things like that, that would be you know, you, you kind of global, not unique to this particular investigation. Is that the, because I, I feel like that's kind of what, again, what we're hearing from the public. Um, is that a needle that's just too difficult to like thread, so to speak? Um, not, not specifically. I think it's difficult when we're talking about policy versus operations. I think some of that would be maybe a discussion between the chief and I. I will tell you that it, it, it's very complicated right now because we're in a time of transition at the police department. Um, been very helpful to have uh, the interim chief here, but he's leaving in how many days here? Nine days. Um, and so it is, uh, it, it's it's extremely difficult. It's something that, yes, we have um, policy initiatives that I'll be looking for. We're hopeful that this uh, police chief search process is gonna you know, find a candidate and that would be something that I would work with that next chief on. Um, but I don't have, and I think there are specifics in this report, which are unfortunately confidential at this yeah. point that could, um, that could maybe help educate us and, and help us move forward, but it may take, uh, more time to go to Attorney Albert's comments. More time than uh, than we want um, due to that criminal process that we don't want to impede at all. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dion. Did you have a comment? Or uh, Corporation Council Adair? Did I say your last name correctly? Albert. Okay. I made you into an Adair. Sorry. Can you come up to the mic for a second? Sir. I, sir, flattery will get you everywhere. Listen, I, I, again, I'm hung up on this clarity stuff. What is the posture of the case? You see, telling me you went to the DA is like telling me the sun's coming up tomorrow. It doesn't really tell me anything I don't already know. Is it up for review of a complaint? Has a complaint been approved? Is it awaiting the grand jury? I just I just want the posture of the case. I don't even know the answer to that. I, I... So did some detectives walk it over? Is that is that what's happened? I, I don't know. Okay. Does the chief know? Yes. He was assigned to a detective and has been submitted to the DA's office for review. For a complaint. For a possible complaint. Okay. That only enhances 
the reason that we should have this confidential, given it's at the earliest posture possible. I think that's helpful for the public that's listening. It's not just, hey, it went over the DA's office. I think we need to be specific where we can be. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Attorney Albert. You mean thanks for nothing? <laughs> okay. I want to call her ADA, Michael. We got to do something about that one. What is she, an ACA under your rules or what? Uh, uh, Associate Corporation Council, AACC, ACC Albert. Okay. I'll work on that. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second, but before I call a vote, I'm looking to see if there's any additional comment on that motion to go into executive session. Um, but in the absence of the clerk, I'll call the roll. So Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevorrow? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? No. Councillor uh, Phillips? No. And I am a yes. So we will, we are voted seven to two to go into executive session. It's 7.45 p.m. Um, we will not be coming back into chambers. We'll adjourn ourselves over to 2.09. Um, and we are now in executive session.